G'day Warriors of Chaos, AOS Coach here, and we are talking all things Slaves to Darkness, revisiting them in uh, General's Handbook 2023. I'm very excited with my guest, uh, a man who I believe quite possibly could be the 11th ever chosen, Bavor Azavar Kul, and uh, obviously the, the great <laughs> the great Archeon we currently know today. It is Ben Hoskins, who also claims to be the Baron of the Splintered Fang. He is a top performing Slaves of Darkness player, currently number one on the ITC, but also you came first at the Bay Area Open. You have top 10 at the uh, US Open at Tacoma, as well as Old Town Throwdown. So we have someone who has an incredible amount of experience, and I'm excited to kind of understand where Slaves is at and how do we kind of make the most of Slaves the Darkness in his current General's Handbook, given we are in his primal magic uh, craziness. And are there some spicy picks that maybe we've overlooked from the last season? But before we get into all of that, I'll introduce Ben. Ben, say good day and uh, let the people know who you are. All right. Good day, uh, Coach Chat and Coach Watchers. I'm always happy to be here. Um, yeah, I'm a writer director based in Los Angeles. I've been playing Warhammer since I was a kid, mostly fantasy, but then I got back into uh, Sigmar in 2021 and got really involved with the tournament scene here in Southern California. Uh, I've only ever played Slave to Darkness. That is my one faction. It's uh, much like uh, if people are aware of Gareth Thomas, the legendary Blades of Corn player. I'm pretty sure he only plays Blades of Corn, and I only play Slave to Darkness. Um, it's my, by far my favorite book. I love the models. And I love the balance within the book, both externally and internally. Yeah, it, I remember looking at the Slaves book for the first time. So I play a lot of Stormcast, uh, or at least when the Slaves book dropped, I was playing a lot of Stormcast. And I remember reading this book and I'm like, man, this is exactly what Stormcast wishes it had. It's a well-written book, lots of great War Scrolls, lots of interesting builds, and really not a lot of duplication there's a lot of roles that have just every unit has like a has a place and things may not be useful today but it feels like as the meta shifts you've always got a tool that you can respond with and i agree it's a, it's a really good book yeah. yeah definitely i think that there are certainly worse goals that go in and out of favor but what's nice about the slice of darkness book is it's not contingent on any one war scroll or any one faction to be a fun book or an interesting book to play or to be competitive um i think that that's the power of the book is that no matter where the meta is there's something really interesting you can do and you can also go counter meta and make something really new and interesting out of slice of darkness especially when you factor in then you have all the allies from all the other factions in chaos yeah, and I'm now really looking forward to unpacking this with you because when Slaves to Darkness first dropped, it felt like we were just scratching the surface. Everyone was talking about Chosen, everyone was talking about Warriors and Knights, and everything was Nurgle Banner, and then you take Corn Banner. You know, obviously we got the change to the Nurgle Banner, thankfully. If it stayed as it was with that bubble of minus <laughs> one, like, like, holy, holy yeah. wow. Um, uh, yeah, but like, we, you know, like we scratched the surface, you know, Splintered Fang was popular, you know, like your Varengard and Archeon is, is still who it is. But I feel like with so many War Scrolls, there is some list tech that I'm sure you've kind of unpacked over the last, getting close to 12 months now. And given it's a magic focused meta, um, some things might have risen in popularity. Definitely. I mean, you know, all some of the factions, I will say, on a tournament competitive play, I don't think they're particularly viable yet. I'm I, actually what I'm excited by is if someone can find a Despoilers or Legion of the First Prince sub faction build that's competitive, I will buy that person dinner. That is an amazing, amazing accomplishment if you can do that. But I think outside of that, host the ever chosen Kabbalists, Ravagers, um, and and uh, Knights of the Empty Throne are all viable builds in each meta. Now we are in the wizard meta and there's a certain spell out there, I'm sure people might've heard of it, it's called Merciless Blizzard. And slaves, because of their innate ability to cast 3d6, and we can get into that, but that's a heroic action, they can just then add an and or die and now you've got Blizzard all over the all over the place. And I think that's really elevated Kabbalists, which are the wizard sub-faction for slaves. 
Yeah, yeah, agreed. I, I was about to interrupt you and try to drop a joke and say that it was going to be like it's rupture, right? Everyone's talking about rupture and how great rupture is. No, it's it's Blizzard and Horfrost. That's <laughs> yeah, it, it's Blizzard and Horfrost. That's the reason you run three plus and or loci uh, in slaves mats because you want Blizzard and Horfrost. Let's let's start the conversation with where they're currently placed in the the meta, right? And it seems like they are traditionally, as an army, not top tier. So they're definitely not traditionally competing in the five and O bracket. When you look at their general win win percentage, uh, Woe has Hammer has them around the forty eight to forty nine, which is around the middle ground. Like they, like they're not at the bottom. They're certainly not like Skaven and Fire Slayers and and Daughters of Cain, according to their data. But they're definitely not up there with Corn. Uh, Ossiak Bone Reapers, Seraphon, they're, they're in that little middle ground. And again, that's good because it means that you're not getting aggressively points increased. Your uh, rules aren't dram dramatically changing. You are in this good kind of middle and it allows you to, with your skill expression, go 4-1-5-0. How do you feel about Slaves to Darkness right now when you take them to a tournament and how do you feel about their ability to compete? Yeah, I mean, I think it's it's they're very viable in a tournament setting. Um, I think there are some armies where getting it to four one is a mir is a miracle. I think with slaves, it's actually not. I, I, it's obviously always hard to four one or to five zero, but I don't think it's insurmountable with this book or 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 easy either. I think it's it's a really balanced book in the meta, in internally, externally, and so if you look at some of the big bads right now, death uh, and corn and um who else uh, nurgle seems to have shot up lately but uh these big bads um a lot of them will go up and then they'll get batted down because the books themselves are out of whack so the war scrolls aren't balanced so they're always just playing ping pong with the points but because slaves to darkness the war scrolls are quite balanced it means that you're not going to have as much fluctuation and so the variation in win rate is mostly just a matter of what are the big bads and whether they are just impossible for anyone to beat, in my opinion. The other thing to remember about Slaves of Darkness is, is for a long time, it was one of the most popular factions, along with Stormcast, um, which means that you have a huge, wide pool of players playing it, from people who was the first tournament ever, to people like Phil Marshall in the UK, who I, I, is, my, is another great Slaves player. Um, and, and we're trying to you know elevate the meta, but at the same time, you do have an averaging out that would result in a, around a 48, 49%, just by virtue of the fact that so many people are playing them. I think the other thing to consider is because you have such a wide range of war scrolls, it does take time for you to find the list that works for you. Yes. Um, you know, like in an, I, I mean, like Iron Jaws, for example, or Fire Slayers, you, you've got a hodgepodge, but you've got, you know, what, 15 war scrolls usually at most in that kind of little bucket. And to illustrate your point that you just mentioned about win percentage, rewind yourself six months ago when, you know, Gloomspite Gits and Beast of Chaos were really terrorizing the meta. Now they're sitting in a very similar bucket to where Slaves the Darkness is around that, you know, middle, early 50s to kind of late, like you're kind of in that middle ground. And you start to see like Ossiak Bone Reapers starting to slip a little bit. Um, as they've had points adjustments and rules adjustments. So uh, just to kind of reinforce the point that you mentioned, that it is a well-written book. Yes, Post of the Ever Chosen went from a four-up rally to a five-up rally. Yes, there's been some other little changes, but on the whole, not a lot of big changes for you. Yeah, and I, it's, you said something really uh, great, Coach, which is that you talked about the finding an army play style that works for you. And this is really important. I think it's really, it should be emphasized, it couldn't be emphasized more for tournament players, is if you are playing an army because you're, I don't know, trying to get the biggest, baddest army, but it doesn't really vibe with how you like to play the game, whether you like to play it as a very aggro alpha strike list or a very methodical control list or something with ranged or something with more just all melee all the time, you have to find what you actually enjoy about the game, like what elements and what play styles make work for you and then just build that list. And since Slaves is such a big book, there are lots of different play styles. There's a control play style, there's an alpha play style, there's tempo, there's trading play styles. Finding the one that makes your heart sing at a tournament, so to speak, is what's gonna ultimately result in you have placing. 
because if you are not motivated and excited by your army and by the way it plays, you won't get interested intellectually as to how this army can play into the other meta armies. And so you won't have as much fun and therefore you won't be as good at the tournament because it's not, you're, you're not matched up yet with the play style that fits you like a glove. Yeah, it's funny because there's a local guy in my community, Craig, shout out to, to Craig from the Lords of Ruin, who from the very first day I met him in first edition, he was always running Archeon and Varengard. This is first edition ever chosen book and he's run it ever since. Like he's, he's obviously deviated here and there, but he's gone from the peaks and the troughs of, you know, when it was really hard to compete to now he's, it's just his favorite play style. And uh, I know him as that Archeon and, and Varengard or, just the, the the host of the ever chosen type army and you're right like there's a skill expression that as a player especially with a deep roster it's easy to hear about all the things you know oh my gosh chosen are op you know oh my god you know corn is so powerful but i know when i first dipped into slaves i'm like i want to tap into slanesh i i think there's some really cool stuff yes i know corn is better in combat yes i know nurgle does the grind better but for me, Slanesh was something that I really wanted to build around, and there was some really cool stuff, and I think um, it, that kind of stuff gets hidden behind the noise. Yeah, and, and I think it's also, um, you know, to your, to your point about the, uh, you know, like a player, like playing one, like, like, like for example, the Archeon, for example, and this is just to give me as an example, and this is gonna, shout out to everyone else who's always played Archeon. I actually don't own the model, and have never played a game with Archeon. So you probably should just kick me off this channel right now. But I have never played a game with Archeon. I've never run him. I've never tried him. I haven't even done him on Tabletop Simulator. And the reason is 800 points in a single model is not my play style. I like the versatility of having some, maybe some big units of Varengard, but to have multiple pieces on the board and actually the actual footprint of Archeon, the size of his footprint, and the way you play with him is not a way that I like to play Sigmar. Nothing wrong with him. He's great. But I mean, in the sense that it's not the one that fits me like a glove. And so it's not the one I'm going to get good at. So I'm going to ask you, what is, what, there, what is it? Yeah, who love Archeon. <laughs> oh, yeah, what is it? Um, yeah, so uh, I think there are two play styles I really enjoy. Um, so I was playing Slaves back in second edition, the second edition book as well. And I ran a pretty control heavy list then. And Towards the end of the second book, I found a supplement in the old Marathi supplement. It was called for it was called a sub faction called Idolaters. This is the, this was the old like Warcry cultist sub faction before the current book, which is now it's Ravagers. And you could make a chariot and, your general, right? Yes, and I was building a chariot to be my. I had, so I was building towards that list, and then the new book came out, and that then it was no longer relevant. But I had bought four boxes of twenty splintered fang when they were 50 us for 20 splintered fang this is the story of how the splintered the player on the splintered fang there we go so i bought 80 splintered fang before the third edition book had come out before we had the rules before we knew that they had three attacks each and they wounded on twos and that they were amazing and i bought all these splinter fang and the book comes out and i think oh i think i have to play ravagers because i have all the splintered fang <laughs> Um, and I did try Kotad, I did try Night Stampy Throne, which is the big Varengard smash smash list. It wasn't really my play style at the time. And I sort of really hunkered down and leveled up my play with Ravagers. And that's the list that I've done the best with so far. Um, I went 5-0 at Bay Area Open and took the trophy there, which was great and fun. And then at Tacoma, I, it was weird, I actually went 5-1 at Tacoma because we had a shadow round. I lost the one game in the shadow round to someone who ultimately was undefeated. He's a great guy, shout out to Stark. He's a great great player, I hope to see him again. Um, he was playing uh, Seraphon. Uh, but yeah, so Ravagers is the play style I play, and that's where you have a lot of cultists. Um, in my case, I think I have over 120 cultists in my, in my army, I think. So I think it's like 180 wounds of almost mostly cultists. Uh, it's 15 units and two drops. Uh, it's a lot of configuration, and that's my that's the faction I play. It's very control based. It's very tempo based, and it's also, in my opinion, one of the most elegant recursion driven sub factions in the game. I be, partly because, and we can get to this when we go into the sub faction, but 
that sub faction is the most versatile recursion faction due to the way that it's heroic action bringing back units in both players' turns in the hero phase, and that there's no movement restriction on your in your turn. So you can bring him back outside nine inches, but then you can still move the six inch cultist unit, and now you have your little splinter thing unit coming in for a charge, and it makes them very versatile. Yeah, I, I must admit, I am excited to finally see the rise of the cultists. You know, I remember, yeah. gee, yeah. second edition when everyone was talking in Marauders, and I'm like, man, I just want these sculpts to disappear at some point because, uh, you know, there were so many great first edition Warcry models. I'm like, surely this is going to eventually phase out the, um, the, the Marauder. And you're right, like, like everyone was taking things like Untamed Beast for the pre-game move, or you would, there was like, the, or great. the, um, or the uh, Iron Golems because you teleport yeah. them and like get an armor save. But outside yeah. of that, you didn't actually get to see a lot of cultists. Now you're starting to get a bunch of rules. Now you're building around yeah. it. They're becoming a great trade piece. They can be really viable and can, can, can do some interesting things between the Warriors, the Knights, the Chosen, and having a bunch oh, yeah. of cultists as well. Definitely. I think, and all, they're also cool models, which is a double-edged sword because they're beautiful models, but I do miss the fact that the war, that the Marauders and the Warriors, which are pretty compact, line up pretty easily, whereas my beautiful Splinter Fang gets tangled with each other. <laughs> We're not moving them on the board. But if you're someone who's a hobbyist or, or as, as well as a competitive player or both, um, it's they're beautiful models. The, the Warcry Cultists are an amazing range, um, and they're very fun to paint. And if I was more of a painter... Um, I do dedicate a lot of time specifically to them. Yeah, I, I do. I do enjoy them. I love um, the Corvus Caval. I love. You know, there's so many cool models, and I there's hope so many good keep, ones. And, oh, and yeah. I hope they keep expanding upon it because it's a great concept. It's a really cool concept. But Ben, you have been deviating into the rules a little bit, and I think it's a great. <laughs> no, 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 no. It's <laughs> it's a it's a perfect segue to actually start bringing this to life. So. Yeah. To, okay. to remind everyone, not, not that you need the reminding at this point, we're in month four of General's Handbook, and this seems to be it's going to be a 12-month General's Handbook, so it's not like last year where it was a six-month type piece. We are in the realm of Antor. It's about primal magic. There's a bunch of spells that we've already alluded to. But, Ben, when you think about Slaves of Darkness and you look at the rules and, you know, you do have access to Antorian lo locuses like the Sorcerer Lord on foot, are you thinking about how do I make the most of my Primal Magic dice? Do you not care yes. about it at all and you just want the extra CP? Like, when you look at these rules, what does it mean to you and how does it start your list building? And obviously we'll move to the Allegiance abilities in a sec, but talk to me through these particular rules as a Slaves player. Yeah, definitely. So I think the important thing to remember with the Slaves book is we have very, very good innate casting magic, but our spells are somewhat lacking in some areas. So, and we can talk about how the the primal the realm spells really help with that. But to your thing, I think that the Chaos Sorcerer Lord is one of the best wizards in the game, particularly in the Cobbler's faction, because now he becomes a two cast wizard instead of a one cast wizard, and they're also indoor loci, so they can take. Uh, the frost spells, and they can use the, the primal magic dice, and they get the um, extra cast and dispel. But I think the important thing to remember is that because we have such, we have this innate three d six cast, which is a heroic action for a wizard to do, and in Pablos you can do it with all the wizards near that wizard. The use of primal magic dice doesn't have to be to get your big spell off. It's actually like more of a kicker. So you, if you're if you've got a big spell and you've got like you know like a ten and you want to kick it up. You can throw a primal magic die where someone else might have to have thrown one just to get the spell off. The other thing you remember is that primal magic dice are actually sometimes best used as a defense, as a dispel, or a, sorry, unbind casting dice, where you're actually saving them for your opponent's magic phase because you can just shut down their crazy spell. I think it's a huge boost to factions like Slaves of Darkness that don't have a lot of pluses to dispel or auto dispels or easy access to counter magic. Because it allows us to, for that one really annoying spell, we can just throw a primal magic die and stop the opponent from getting off, you know, Spirit Gale or, gosh, what's that one that um, Skaven had to make the guys fight on death? Anyways, yeah, that kind of stuff. Um, you know, you can still, you can shut down the opponent's really nuts spell with primal magic dice. So I actually think this, this realm is really great for slaves. 
dreaded death frenzy, by the way. Uh, Thank you. Thank you. No, the, I you literally just record. I recorded. <laughs> I literally recorded Skaven yesterday, so it's a perfect time. Like, I, I look. I, oh, I play. Good. I play. I play against Skaven enough to know that spell. But you're right. And yeah. um, I love shared this. <laughs> oh, well, oh, yeah, we talked a lot about rad ogres and coherency <laughs> changes too. It's yeah. almost like you, you, you've snuck in and seen the video. One of the Maybe. things that I one of one of the things that I found so um, in the last couple of months, I've been playing a lot of blue spike gits. But don't at me at this point because um, I've been playing a very interesting sub faction that I've never seen anyone really play before called Bad Snatchers. And Bad Snatchers is about re rolling one of my casting dice. Now, as you know, you can't use a primal magic dice and a, and a re roll at the same time. But what I found is by getting consistency across my other spells, I can put my primal magic dice into unbinding. I can put it into yep. my big spells and I get more spells off. And I imagine through, through like you've mentioned Kabbalist, for example, and, and I'm sure you'll tell me more about why it's a good season for Kabbalist. Um, you can use this offensively and defensively, which is, which is, which is great. A hundred percent. And I don't know if we're going to get to the, the slide with, with the heroic actions or sub actions, but the, the, that is a hundred percent true. And I think that, Primal Magic Dice, for some people, it's it's kind of a bonus, but they didn't necessarily need it. We actually sort of needed it for counter magic, and it's really helpful now. Um, and here we are in Allegiance Abilities. So, yeah. <laughs> so let, let's talk Allegiance Abilities and, for example, the Marks of Chaos, because we'll talk about the damn Legions um, on, a, on a later sure. slide when we've, got, when we've got the information up. But when okay. you look at the yep. Allegiance Abilities, and by the way, actually, before we get to Allegiance Abilities, um, a couple of things I just want to acknowledge a couple of changes that have happened over the last couple of months. You got some war scroll changes. So, sorry, war scroll point changes. So, Chosen yes. went down 10. Uh, Chaos Lord on Kakadrak went down 20. So, did Chaos Warriors yeah. went down 20. It's going down. Uh, yeah. More importantly, the Ogroid Theridans went down 10. I want, to find, oh, I want to find out if there's ever going to be day people are going to use them, not as replacement Bulgors. Mm -hmm. And then Varangard went down 10. So, any comments that you would add on any of those points discounts and has it changed yes. maybe the viability yes. of, of, of choices? I mean, I think that the Varengard drop, the Warriors drop, the Chosen drop have made Kabbalists a really strong choice um, because those three units are sort of the backbone core, along with Knights who had a drop earlier, are the core of a good traditional Slaves of Darkness Kabbalist list, or, or hosts list, for that matter. Um, I don't know how much it's going to impact things like Knights of the Empty Throne, because they were always all Varengard. Um, and I guess the points drop means they can maybe throw in a unit of Untamed Beasts. So I haven't played that faction in a long time, uh, that sub-faction. But uh, I think that the points drops have helped. I will say I think that Theradons are the next big thing. And if, if Theradon stocks, in my opinion, through the roof, um, my friend uh, is uh, and I are hatching a plan. He's a local buddy of mine in the, my club, and we're talking about maybe an all Theradon list and coming to tournaments near you soon, uh, or mostly Theradon list. Um, I think they're very viable. If people aren't familiar with um, AOS Stats Hammer or there's a few other Math Hammer things, just do the math on Theradons. Just do the math and see what happens. They're pretty punchy. I think they punch harder than Varengard. They don't get the double fight, but, but they are very good for 150 points. 150 points, 15 wounds, 5 up save. Uh, the Obviously, the, the great axe is rend minus 2. If it's you damage put, 3. It's damage 3. And yeah, rend, 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 <laughs> two, dam, rend 2 damage. Yeah, I was it's gonna, crazy. Uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> I, I was going to ask you, are you someone... Uh, you're not going to tell me your full science because you haven't worked it out yet, or you don't want to tell us yet. But are you a are you a great axe person? Are you a shield and falcon? Oh no! I, 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 this is this is one hundred percent no shield. No, no, all axes all the time. Sorry, Dam it's Ren two damage three, and then they can um, they should always unleash their savagery. They should always be savage. Uh, this is the Theradon tech. Always be savage. I think they have four attacks then each, threes and threes, which is really good for a unit that's only one hundred fifty points. And then it's minus two damage three. And they all have five wounds each. So they, and then that means that they're going to count that unit of three will count as six models on an objective, which is important. 
Um, I think sometimes those bigger wound model, those bigger wound units with like they're like four wounds is an awkward number because they're still counting just the same size as a you know a little footman. Um, so for objective play, I think it's actually really great that they're five wounds. Uh, and also, you know, just 150 points for 15 wounds is a good deal. Um, and with that much damage potential, I mean, that armor is not great, but you're not getting them for the armor, you're getting them for those big axes. So to answer your question, axes, big axes all the time. Yeah, plus that once per battle, you can do an extra attack, but you just can't receive inspiring presence. You're like, yeah. okay, I'm going to... You know, well, it's, you, you're going to have to lose three or two for it to even matter, so... I was going to say, even if you're taking them as just through units of three, like doesn't matter yeah. like obviously a unit of six you can have to worry about them but like a couple of units of three it's not a bad not a bad little shout the, the points might be finally right for them to to be entered into a list uh we're talking about units of nine over here but yeah three is good too <laughs> All right, all right. I'm, I'm, I'm just like putting, I'm, put, I'm putting my toes in the water and seeing that it, it, it's, it's cool and it's refreshing. You're just jumping. Oh no, it's very feasible. It's very. I mean, look, I, I, I play, I played meme lists. The splintered fang were a bit of a meme, and now the pterodons might be a meme. So we'll see. <laughs> Got to get some models first, though. Got to get a bunch all of pterodons. Right. Well, I, th I think a lot of people who bought that original box might be sleeping on them because I certainly haven't even built mine. I think they so. are. No. <laughs> let's talk these allegiance <laughs> abilities. Like, let's talk All these right, allegiance yeah, yeah, yeah. abilities. So, um, talk to me about things. Like, how do you see the allegiance abilities working and the value of certain ones in the current meta? You know, is because yeah. we're in a magic season, is now Zinch? Is it a good time to be Zinch? Like, talk no. to me. Okay, so uh, Undivided uh, is good on, there is like, I would say Undivided is good on heroes because the likelihood of you turning into a spawn is much lower since, if, you know, whenever your heroes are running on objectives that your opponents control, you have to make an Eye of the Gods roll. And so there's a 1 in 36 chance that your huge, important character that you really need for the rest of the game just turns into a spawn whenever he runs on an objective. It also means that when you roll for a spell called Chaotic Conduit, which is to create an Eye of the Gods roll, which is used usually typically for a tactic, your hero isn't, again, going to turn into a spawn. And when you get to re-roll one of the dice, you can try to get them a ward, you can get an extra cast. So it's, it, I would say Undivided is pretty good on a lot of the heroes, um, especially the one that you're going to try and get these Eye of the Gods rolls with. Um, in terms of the actual units themselves, I, other, I mean, some are locked. Like the cultists are, have to be undivided unless you take a certain command trait, which we'll talk about uh, called Idolater Lord later. Um, but yeah, undivided mostly for heroes, in my opinion. Corn, corn is good, but I think it's mainly good on cavalry um, because you're more, more likely to get that charge off and get that extra attack. Um, I have yet to use the command abilities for corn, undivided, or mm, yeah, that's I have not used corn or undivided's com like command ability, like slay worthy foes or let the blood flow. Those are I haven't used them. But and this is where it's important. Zinch was very feasible in a very limited way for a minute, and I used it at Old Town Throwdown to good effect, which is that until recently you could teleport and still use Merciless Blizzard. So you effectively gave yourself the ability to have a 21-inch Merciless Blizzard because you could teleport the guy 10, 9 inches up and then he had a 12-inch range. And so I was running three Sorcerer Lords of Zinch and they would just ping-pong with each other. And since they also need to ping-pong with each other uh, and be near each other for the 3D6 cast draw and power circle, then it was helpful for Zinch for them to be able to ping pong around the board to be where they needed to be. And I still think that's a useful method because sometimes you need that wizard to be a little closer to buff your unit, and this is a way to do that. Um, so I think Zinch is still very viable on wizards. I think that you're you're losing too much putting it on a unit just for warp reality, which is the spell. The six plus spell ignore, if that was a five up, I would take Zinch more often, but it's a six up, and so it's just not reliable enough for you to really use it. Um, so then the remaining two choices I think are really good. So Nurgle is great for tanky stuff, but even for cavalry, people have been putting it on Varengard and using it as a meat grinder because they're hard to kill. I mean, subtract one from wound rolls in melee is hard to counter because there's a lot that gives plus one to hit. There's not as much that gives plus one to wound. And so you're able to reduce damage usually by about 10 to 
30%, depending on, again, where they're at in, my, in their wound roll. And the number of times I've had opponents say to me, man, that minus one to wound really did a lot of work there. And it's true. They'll, have a, they'll be needing threes, and then they now need fours, and it's made a huge difference. Um, that command ability can be useful. The D3 mortals with all the units near it, I've used that before. Um, and then Slanesh is really interesting as a utility piece. So because of the command ability, you can make one of your Slanesh units that ran get to charge. So you usually will put it on Chosen. Chosen have, uh, I think, a five-inch move, and then they can auto-run the six. So they have 11-inch move. And then they can charge, and they're going to get an extra plus one to charge because they're Mark of Slanesh. So they're going to get plus two from the drummer. That makes them almost as speedy as cavalry, if not speedier. Um, and then they, when they can combine that with that, the Slanesh sub-faction has one of the better ensorceful banners, which is the Slaves and Enhancement. Um, it's kind of a no-brainer to put Slanesh on your Chosen, in my opinion, um, if you're running a more aggressive list. Um, in terms of this is so far, I've mostly spoken about traditional slaves units, so like warriors, knights, those things like warriors with Nurgle are impossible to move. Knights with Nurgle are also a good choice. Um, I, there's some discussion amongst people in the AOS coach chat and other places about what the best mark is for cultists, and that'll come up later again when we talk about idolater reward. But just to hit on marks now, I am of the camp that if you're running ravagers, um, which is the all cultists marauders sub faction. Nurgle is your best bet because you are playing a control and denial list and just making the grind of your opponent just a little longer can win you the game. So that's my seal on marks. Yeah, I, I like that a lot. And I would tend to agree, actually. You know, you it's very easy to pick, say, a mark of corn. Like if you want to mark your, you know, to get more killy power from it. But like when you look at most of the cultists, they're not the ultimate killing machines. It's the utility and the abilities they bring to the party and it's tying your opponent down, screening them out from the juicy things. Yes, Splintered Fang, um, you know, there's a couple of exceptions to that rule, but I would actually tend to agree. I think if you were going to mark a cultist, the Nurgle would be a great one or um, to your point, Slanash as well, if you want to play the movement game and... Yes. Um, I, I and, and, you know, knowing Age of Sigmar is definitely a movement style game. Um, I, that's another reason, like when you add the layers of, say, um, d demonic speed or you throw down um, a war shrine or you know, war, war, war shrine, the war shrine. Yeah. Um, I always confuse between war altar and war shrine being a, a, a city of Sigmar person. But like, like there's a lot <laughs> of additional, there's a lot of additional movement shenanigans in there. And, um, especially for some of the battle tactics right now, movement is definitely critical. And, you know, it's not necessarily about killing. It's about getting into different parts of the, the board, being able to, yeah. So I'd agree. I agree. I mean, I think that's, I think that's always been the case. I think the bet, Sigma is at its best when movement plays a big role um, because movement is a part of the game that is not just really just dice rolls. It's actually it requires a lot of skill and thought and planning. And it, it is, that's a lot of, places for high skill expression for what I would call really important, beautiful moments, whereas a player makes a really clever move and choice. And that's one of the things I love about Sigmar is that it's so movement driven that you can win by that. And that is movement is, is almost always just, that's tactical decisions. That's not hedge, hedging dice rolls. That's you are making a good play and that is winning you the game. And I think that's why when we are in a movement focused meta, it's a really fun meta. Yeah, I think in previous seasons, we've probably had a bit more of a killy type meta where, you know, the battle tactics are rewarding. <laughs> yeah. Well, the battle tactics are rewarding yeah. killing. Yeah, more. yeah, yeah. This yeah, one, yeah, definitely. There's, so, there's so much even uninteractive, no, like, yeah. That's yeah. why, that's why retreating is probably one of the most underutilized tactics in AOS. Oh, yeah. No, that's get Furies also. We'll talk about Furies later. Furies are a slaves unit that are fun for retreating. Yeah, I was talking. I can't remember who I was talking to. They were talking about Furies, and they not only love Furies, but being able to do surround and destroy, and doing some of the other things. Like they're just such a great, great ability. Yeah. Um, but let's talk the other parts of your ability. So you've referred to a few times now the heroic action. So uh, I'll, I'll, yes. I'll let you continue. Let you continue now that it's on the screen. Yeah. All right. So uh, there are two 
these slaves locked heroic actions in addition to one for Ravagers, the sub-faction. We'll just talk about the ones on the screen right now. Um, Pledge the Dark Gods, uh, I've never used that, um, mainly because you only get one heroic action. Um, and I would much rather use it on the, the one below it, which is called Draw and Power. So that one, you get to pick a wizard, and, he, and then he's uh, now he's a 3d6 cast wizard, which is great. And yeah, if you get double ones, there's a d6 miscast, but the chances of your spell going off going so much higher and your opponent not being able to dispel it makes it always worth it to roll the 3d6 and to make it a big cast. Um, and then, you know, with the Cobblest faction, it means that all the wizards near that wizard can do that too, and they already have additional casts. So now you have six to eight spells going off at 3d6 casts. Um, and that's how I was playing Cobbleus, for example, at Old Town Throwdown. Um, in terms of the Eye of the Gods, it's an interesting mechanic. I think it can be really fun um, from both of a narrative point of view, but also, um, you know, there's some utility to the Eye of the Gods if you play it right. Uh, if you're running undivided on your heroes, you're going to get to reroll one of the dice. You're going to roll 2d6 when you take an objective from your opponent or kill a hero or monster um, with someone with the Eye of the Gods. And some of these are, I would say, fairly useless. Um, I mean, obviously snubbed by the gods, and you don't want to spawn them. Healing D3 is cute and fun, but Arcane Awakening is interesting, because it'll give your wizard an additional cast, and you can get that, you can roll out of the gods in the hero phase, so theoretically you can have given yourself an extra uh, roll of the eye of the gods, and then give yourself an extra cast that you can use that phase, which is pretty fun. Um, there's also the ward with the 5 up, and then there's the 11 to 12. Now, Never use the 11 to 12 to make a demon prince. You will be downgrading your model, I guarantee you, no matter whether he's a chieftain or a, a manticore. That's a downgrade. But instead, you get to pick something. So you don't have to turn the guy into a demon. You can have your hero get to be have, pick something else. And so then you usually would pick the ward, which is a 5 up ward, which is great on a liquid wizard. Or you'd pick Arcane Awakening. Or if you're trying to get a a punchy hero like a Karkadrak, you get the Rend, um, which is number eight, Slaughter Strength, which is quite good on um, the Karkadrak, which has now gone down in points. Can I just say how much of a royal shame it is that the new Scott Demon Prince just, it just doesn't work. Like, you look at the ability, and it's the abilities, yeah. right? Like, Nur Nurgle probably has the best of the versions. Would you agree that... Of all the demon princes, Nurgle yes. is the best. I, turning off wards is cool. It's a really cool utility, but here's the problem. I believe it's a heroic action to do so. And so you're not casting on a 3d6 or summoning a unit with Ravagers. You only get one heroic action in your, in your hero thing. And so it's not usually worth losing a 3d6 cast on or one to infinite spells uh, to do that heroic action. There is one use case for the Demon Prince, and I use him every time I play Ravagers, and that is that on his War Scroll he can either have wings and look cool, or look less cool and have a trophy rack. And the trophy rack is a 9-inch, wholly within bubble of I don't take Battle Shock. Now, when you have Bravery 6 Cultists with one wound models, you, they're going to take a lot of Battle Shock unless a Demon Prince is there to say, we're not taking Battle Shock. So I think that's the main use for him right now is preventing battle shock on cultists. In fact, I would say it's the only use for him right now. He would have to go down even more in points, and even then, I don't think I'd take him. He would have to be like fifty points. I mean, that's an exaggeration, but he is not good. If he was a nine wound model, he'd be different because then he would be he could hide and not get shot, and then maybe he has a use now. But he's a ten wound non monster who has uh, one weapon, he used to have two. He, used to, he hit harder in the old book than he does in the current book, in, even with the you know sort of punch creep that we've experienced where things have gone up in random damage. He hit harder in the old book than he does now. And I get it, GW was Blood Slick Ground, no more Demon Princes. Um, and for those, those listening, Blood Slick Ground was... A silly ability that demon princes had, or specifically corn demon princes had in the old book. It was the it you, was the worst. It, it that was, eighteen it was silly. that yeah. eighteen inch aura took up half the board. It was the worst. Yes, and for those who, who were not here for second second edition slaves, this was a war scroll that halved run and charge rolls within eighteen inches of this demon prince. So 
He was actually less oppressive in Slaves to Darkness than he was in every other Chaos Unit uh, book that would just borrow him for that ability. So good riddance to that, but he got really nerfed too far in the other direction. It's a good call out, by the way, and I was going to ask you if he was nine wounds, would it change? Because, you know, he's a yes. three-up armor save, you know, the eight-inch eight move, obviously the wings increases it. Um, you know, and you're right, though, like the fact that it's a, a heroic action, if it was not a heroic action, like different story, but it's a yeah. big... Oh, yeah, if it was just an aura, yeah. It's a big it's a big cost considering you do have a couple of extra even drawn on power. Do I want the Nurgle thing or do I want drawn on power? I'll take drawn on power every time. That's without even yeah. going into Kabbalists. Like I'll always take that. Or I'll go for an extra CP. I'll go for, you know, hero recovery, whatever. Yeah, I mean, Games Workshop, if you're listening to me and AOS coach, um, if you were to do an errata where you got rid of the fact that it needs to be a heroic action and it was just an aura, and you can pick your inch amount GW, you can pick whatever you want. But if you made that just an ability on them that wasn't tied to losing a heroic action, I think that your internal balance team would see a lot of uh, demon princes on the field, and not in an overpowered way, but just in a now they're going to buy the model because now it's useful. So GW, Even if you're the- listening, get rid of the heroic. <laughs> Even even the uh, we're kind of like probably spending too much time on the old demon prince that we don't we don't really Absolutely. like anyway. But like the fact <laughs> that the Nurgle, the Nurgle one needs to be within three inches. It's not like this crazy aura of twelve inches no. turning off wards. It's not corn. No. It's like it's three no. inches. Like yeah. Oh god, no. Yeah. No. No. But I, I agree. Yeah, Eyes, Eyes of the Gods, I, it's a cool mechanic. I've said ever since this book has came out, it's something that I personally wouldn't build around. It's neat. Uh, if you're a fan of it, awesome. Keep doing it. Uh, for me, I want a little bit more consistency. And I don't, and I, yeah, you can build into it, but it's probably not for me. But it is fun. It's cool. And uh, it lets you. It's, it's cute. It's, it's a cute mechanic. Yeah, my, my, my gifts brings enough randomness to my armies. Like, I want a little <laughs> bit more consistency. <laughs> yeah. We, we keep talking Kabbalist, and I'm going to pause and not talk Kabbalist just yet because I want to okay. acknowledge ev- everyone else, right? So we're in the meta the wizard yeah. season. The Kabbalist is clearly about wizards, so there's an obvious links coming up. But what about the others? Like, do okay. Ravagers, do spoilers, do they, do they have a place in the current meta? And yes, folks, this is just at a competitive level. If you're a fan of Legion of the First Prince and you love it, I'm not saying don't run it. This is just, what are you thinking at a competitive tournament level? So I know I've said a lot this interview that that the book is really well written. I want to put a little pin on that and say that it, that is very true. However, two sub-factions are not well written. And the War Scrolls are all well written, and four of the sub-factions are really useful and competitive. I, I have feelings about which ones are better than others, but I do think Hosts of the Ever Chosen, Ravagers, Kabbalists, and Knights of the Empty Throne are all very viable choices in a competitive atmosphere. Legion of the First Prince is so close to being interesting and clever and competitive, but it's just not quite there in terms of the mechanic. If they had made that mechanic more, so if you could do it more than one unit, where you can switch a mark on an on a undivided thing for another, if you could do that with two units, I think now we're talking about a very different and much more interesting faction um and, and, you know in terms of the allying i think if they could coalition demons it would be more interesting but they have to ally them so it's taking up only up to 400 points which is not a lot um and then that just kind of makes legion the first prince end up falling into the abyss over there um again it's a cool faction i think that like you know the bellicor model is beautiful a lot of those um new like the eternus model those are cool models so if you like those models play those models um, just don't play them as Legion of the First Prince. Um, ben, ben, I will, I want to make one comment just on Legion of the First Prince, and it is paying sure. for the sins of the past. There was an interesting – I saw my Discord was talking about this, and I think it's a short-term relief, and maybe it will get addressed at some point. But I saw some interesting discussion around um, allied, um, obviously, demons, you know, your blood letters, your horrors of Zinch, your plague bearers, and your demonettes. And what kind of got drawn out at a Discord was the um, the very first uh, regiment of renown, which was the the Zinch one, where you get uh, is it you get some horrors and you get, you get horror, some... magister, and endless spells. Correct. So, given that they are as a regiment of renown, they are an ally. 
they, there might be some little bit of source when it comes to the, the uh, Legion of the First Prince. I don't know if it'll stick around for too long, but I don't know as a sub-faction mm -hmm. if it's enough to lift it out of the dirt compared to Cabalist host knights. No, I don't think it. I don't think it is. I've looked at that subfaction. I mean, that sorry, that um, army of renown uh, or regiment of renown. We'll get to the armies of renown, but uh, and I don't think it works yet. Um, I I would love to say that's an interesting. I hadn't actually thought of that intersection, but um, I'll give it some thought. That's an interesting thought. I'll, I'll think about it in War, War Scroll Builder at some point. Um, I just, I just don't just, think it's enough, enough to yeah. focus my whole. No, it's certainly not enough. On no, 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 no. It's 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 like more like an intellectual question than it is a tomorrow at tournament. I need to build a Legion of the First Prince list with a regiment of renown. Um, but just to keep going through the sub factions. Uh, so the spoilers also. It's it could be fun the monster smash list with demon princes, but like we just talked about for a while, demon princes are not very good, um, and they in just adding more wounds does not solve the problem we talked about, which is that they're a ten wound non monster. So I will just leave to spoilers as is. I think that could have been an interesting faction, but they didn't write it well, and so it's not. Do you, th do you think with the spoilers it also has to do with the fact that, like, your Middleth Vortex Beast, your Slaughter Brute, your Soul Grinder, even your Manticore, your two varieties of Manticores, they're just not really popular choices right now. And there was a time in 1st Edition and even 2nd Edition where the Chaos Sorcerer Lord on Manticore was a relatively staple into an army, yeah, but none of them are, none of them are really popular, which means that the spoilers doesn't get to tap onto that popularity. And again, it's not as good as the others. Yeah, I agree with you that the, the war scroll, the monster war scrolls, are somewhat lacking. Somewhere in my house, I have a soul grinder where which is kicking around for me to make in in some kind of weird attempt at a spoilers list. Or a, it's a you know, I've I've thought about it. I have thought about it. And I actually would like to run a soul grinder sometime when the points drop for that. But I think that that is a really good point: is that the the monsters don't mesh well enough, and the sub faction doesn't give them enough to make the, to justify putting that war scroll on your list or making it that sub faction. I think two wounds on each friendly monster is just not enough. I, it, it, it does. It's it's oh, two more wounds for the other thing, the, the you know the twenty overkill wounds to mow through. It just doesn't feel enough. And if you look at the monsters in Slaves to Darkness, I'm pretty sure by and large they have, we have, they're all on at best a three up, and that's just the Chaos Lord on Manticore. I think the rest are all on a four up save. And so even if they have decent wounds, they're still on a four up save. Um, and so they're just going to get, and they don't have huge wound counts to begin with. These are not Gargants. Uh, so I just don't think it's viable. Um, Soul but Grinder is eighteen wounds. Soul, Soul Grinder is eighteen wounds, though, so that better put it to twenty. Soul Grinder is still... Soul Grinder is the only one that has, and that's why I was saying it, that is one of the viable models, partly because it has a lot of wounds and it has play in different phases. And weirdly enough, I know we spoke a bit about the size of Archeon's base. I think it's useful on a on a two hundred something point model to have a base that size. I just don't think it is on an eight hundred point model. Um, but. Uh, May I continue to the happy factions that are? Very yeah, yeah, please. I, I just wanted to like, like <laughs> for, for like the the, the the two people who might watch this, and they're like one person's an advocate Legion of the First Prince, waiting yeah. for the day of Bellacore. I'm to waiting rise. too. And then the, the the one person who loves their slaughter brute, we're hoping that that Ben, uh, the eleventh ever chosen, comes and gives them the benefits <laughs> of the spoilers. Maybe, maybe just maybe for that one person who's listening to this. Maybe Vashdor will cross over from 40k to Sigma and will build into the Soul Grinder meta and will help rise up some type of Hashhut type of oh, mechanical monstery thing for great. you. Look forward to fourth edition. Cool. Weirdly enough, if you do like monsters and you do want to run them in a slaves list, Beasts of Chaos have a lot of great allies. And I do use Beasts of Chaos monsters as allies in my Ravagers list. So. You can still have monsters. I would just get them from the other books. Um, so uh, Ninth Stand Be Throne, I think, is somewhat it's it's simple, to be honest with you. It's it's a it's very simple. It's your mounted guys can run and charge. So you're gonna get there quicker. I think Ninth Stand Be Throne is a classic three, two, four, one list because you're gonna run into an opponent who knows how to screen 
and you don't necessarily have the tools to deal with the screens with your Varen Guard. There is a way to deal with screens with Varen Guard. It just doesn't necessarily happen in Knights of the Empty Throne. So Knights of the Empty Throne is the run and charge, and then you have a five up rally, which is good, but I, I've never really been a huge on the, the rally for that mechanic. I think for me, it's more just like I like to alpha strike people. Um, and since only one unit can auto run, it just doesn't seem to work for me for Knights of the Empty Throne. I know that it works for some people, but I do think that it suffers from the a sort of it's a ceiling that is the people who know how to screen, who know how to place units in front, and then your Varen Guard can't fly. So they, they kill you know, the clan rats, and then they get countercharged, or then they get shot, or so on and so forth. And so we need to have a tool to deal with that. And people are probably wondering, like, well, how do I deal with that? Because I have, you know, I don't, we don't really have shooting to clear screens. We don't have a lot of impact hits. We don't have much flying. Well, let me tell you. <laughs> um, and that's the spell called Levitate. And I will, we can get, we'll go to Kabbalist after, but I do want to just put people in people's mind that Levitate is the most, one of the best spells in the game right now for Slayers to Darkness, um, specifically for uh, uh, Varen Guard. So even if you're running that Stampy Throne, you can figure out a way to put Levitate in there. That's worth it because now you have flying Varen Guard. So that screen of billions of zombies, well, now you have a 3d6 charge flying over the zombies. Um, that's pretty good. And my my loss at Old Town Throwdown was I needed, I think, a 12 or a 13 on 3d6 rerolling, and I got in a 10 and an 11. So a uh, shout out to Ben Schimoller with uh, a billion zombies. Um, he, he was sweating for a second because I almost hopped over his screen and killed all his Virtuos characters. But, you know, the dice. Uh, but uh, host of the MP uh, host of the ever chosen. We'll talk about that briefly. Um, I think host of the ever chosen is in a weird place. I think a five up rally is nice. Um, the extra ensorcelled banner is also nice. But I just think that ravagers and cabalists are better. I think that specifically cabalists does host better with the units that you would put in host. So chosen knights warriors are just there. You could have the same war scrolls, and there it's just a better experience to play them in cabalists with a bunch of wizards. It's it's a similar play style. You're both heavy armor. You're both um, marching up the board. You're both, you know, hammer and anvil. But Kabbalists are going to get the buffs off. They're going to have a lot more spells coming off. They're going to have Endless out there. They're going to have Merciless Blizzard. They're going to have Levitate really easily because the 3, 6, on 8 isn't that hard. And so now you see that, like, Host is an interesting sub-action, and it's good, but not as good as Kabbalists with the same units. So if you own those units, I would advise you to play Kabbalists um, if you're playing in competitive play. So uh, going to Ravagers before we really talk about Kabbalists because I think we're in the wizard meta. Ravagers is, in, in a weird way, it's sort of the black sheep of these six factions because it doesn't play like any of them. Um, the other ones, Host and Kabbalists play somewhat similarly. Uh, uh, knights sort of living in the straddling cavalry zone there. But Ravagers is like death. You get to bring your units back. And and this is important for people to remember, you get to bring him back half of the unit destroyed. Worth noting, you can bring back a hero as well because your Dark Oath War Queen and Dark Oath Chieftain are both Dark Oath keyworded. So I run a Dark Oath War Queen, who's a really tanky model, six wounds, four up armor, five up ward, and I can bring her back. So I actually get her twice. Um, and so she's really useful as a sort of point on the board of, of summoning because you are summoning them off the heroes. Now, Ravagers is uh, going to give you that keyword on all your heroes. So when I run Ravagers, it's with a Demon Prince, a Chaos Sorcerer Lord, and a Dark Oath War Queen. All three of them can be the point at which cultists, in my case, Splinter Fang typically, but also Corvus Cabal or anything that's died so far, can come out. And so when you have 15 units, and I think 10 of them are cultist units, uh, no, 8 are cultist units in my army, you're, and you've lost one, you bring another one back. Now... They get to move. They get set up wholly, out, wholly within 12, outside 9 of your enemy. But this is important, and it wasn't an oversight. It was deliberate. They can move after they come back on your, in your turn. So your unit of Splinter Fang, you can now position it perfectly for that exact charge and the exact thing you need it to charge into. So there are times where I will let my unit shock off the board in their turn so that in my turn, I can bring a unit back 
that you know the splinter thing of 20 and now it's 10 but i can bring it back and put it where i want it to be move it and charge and do a lot more targeted damage that way so it's i would say ravagers is the sort of eight dimensional chess not to pat myself on the back too much but it's sort of the eight dimensional chess movement part of slaves of darkness where you are configuring like loci points to summon units and move them all over the board you're trying to also deny your opponent any space on the board to take points you have so many models and with the pre-game move of untamed beasts with the deep strike drop of corvus cabal and with just the sheer number of models you have you can screen your opponent off of points so that even in turn one sometimes i'll take top of one just to prevent my opponent from ever being on objectives outside their zone so you can screen your opponent from getting the actual primary objective points. And that's how Ravagers wins, is that you just are not letting them ever have them take more objectives than your opponent. You're never going to let them have that. They can have two, they can have one, but they're never going to have more. And that's part of the play with them. They are also a attrition-based army in the sense that because you're bringing units back and your opponent typically isn't, you're wearing their army down and maybe yourself and your back. And I actually had a lot of back pain after playing uh, Raptors. Um, and I, but, and this is important, I actually want to caveat everything here. If you are playing Ravagers, and you, are, you owe it to yourself and to your opponent by a clock, uh, this is a nice controversial opinion, but you need to bring a chess clock because your army takes a while. And it is only fair for you and your opponent to both have the same amount of time in the game. I run a chess clock now when I run Ravagers, and if I clock myself out, that's on me. Um, because if you're running an army with that many models, and I say this to people with, with zombies too, like this game is meant to be played by both players, and if an army doesn't finish the game ever by turn three, you're not playing the whole game. So I bring a clock for my Ravagers um, whenever it's allowed at a tournament, just so that I make sure my opponent has the amount of time they deserve to play the game. Um, and, you know, when you're playing a clock, you don't play it to gotcha people. You play it, and you're like, you, you remind people. It's like, no, no, it's your time, or, oh, no, it's my time. It should be on my time. The goal is to prevent the bad play experience of you've gotten through the bottom of round three, and now you have to argue or talk or converse with your opponent about what the rest of the game is like. And I've run into that enough that I now bring a clock because I don't want to have that experience for either player. So if you are running a list like Ravagers, you do need to also maybe get movement trays and just be very smart and quick and efficient about your decision making because that list you will run into the two hour 45 minute mark if you play well and if you don't you're not going to finish your game um you just need to be quick and efficient with that list but if you don't like that you play cobblists so cobblists uh, and you can spend all your time in your hero phase deciding your spell order but um cobblists is i think for most people will be the best choice um right now for slaves because it uses most of the units especially the core units of warriors, knights, chaos, marauder, uh, chaos chosen, not marauders, um, Varengard, and you get access to all your wizards are getting an extra cast. So if you're running three sorcerer lords, you get six cast. They can, they have pretty great buff spells. And now with uh, merciless blizzard, which goes off on a 12, but if you're rolling three, six, it's just one extra primal die and you're pretty much guaranteed. And so that with Horfrost, Horfrost is great in ravagers too, because you can put it on um, the cultists to make them a lot better, but Horfrost is great in Kabbalists on Warriors or on Knights. It makes that four up to hit a lot better because it has a one up to hit or you give them Ren three or whatever. But um, I think Merciless Blizzard is a game changer for us as an army, specifically in Kabbalists, because it gives us access to offensive magic. We don't have that. Our list, our army is War Scroll, our War Scroll spells and our faction spells are almost entirely buffs. They're built around extra charge distance or plus one to hit, plus one to wound, or make your opponent strike last, or roll an eye of the gods. These are and those are great spells, but they're not gonna clear a really annoying thing. Like you can't, you know, throw a blizzard, uh, you can't like throw, you know, demonic speed at uh, I don't know, catacrypts or some nonsense piece that's sitting on the board annoying you, but you can just blizzard them off the board. Or if someone's, you know, got their own version of the Baron Guard, you're like, well, they're now they're dead, and I could go get the thing behind them. Um, so I do think like Blizzard has been a big, big game changer for Kabbalists, even without even saying the fact that the, the, the meta right now and the, the GHB is wizard focused. So a lot of the tactics are wizard focused. Um, I think Kabbalists is great. Um, and if I was, if I valued my back 
I would have probably play Cobbless, only Cobbless, but I only value my back partially, so I play Cobbless and Ravagers right now. Wow. A lot of great insight, and uh, I'll let you have a sip of drink because that was um, Thank you. <laughs> probably, probably, probably the longest time I haven't spoken on a, on a, a channel. Oh, but sorry, like, coach. No, 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 that was not, that was not, that was not, know, a, that, was not a, that was not a jab at all. Maybe yeah. a couple of just little minor things I'll add or maybe questions just in regards Please. to some of the things you mentioned. Not to the Empty Throne. So Varengard being a popular choice with, with the Knights. Do you think that the change to coherency now being one to six has improved or changed the quality of life or even the play style of Knights of the Empty Throne at all? I think, I think it's changed the quality of life of running Varengard, whether you're running them in Cobblis or Knights of the Empty Throne. I think having the ability for you to string them in six wide as opposed to the weird little triangle situation um, is really great for Varengard, particularly since their bases aren't that big. Um, so now not having to clump them, you can you know do some pretty cool movement-y shenanigans or wrap around things. Um, or if you have Levitate, you can jump over pretty easily um, and still maintain coherency with a unit of six. Uh, so I think that that has been a real boost. I think it was a good choice on GW's part as well. I think it was just confusing with the weird three units. Um, but I think it's not just for Kotet. I think it's for any list that uses Varengard. Their utility has gone up. Their points have gone down just a little, but their utility has gone up a lot because they aren't restricted by the six thing. But then again, other armies have that too. So I do think any any army with a three by one, like one by three and then two by three, um, or six, it's, it's useful for that now. Yeah, and obviously when I refer to Knights of the Empty Throne, it's usually because you've taken a, a, at least one block of six, which seems to be a popular choice, while a lot of others yeah. seem to like the, the the size of threes because you get more double fights once per game. But then also that, that goes into like Theridans, which is a unit that benefits from that. Yes. Uh, what else? Is there any other units that benefit from the, the coherency change? Probably not. I think that's it. Yeah, yeah I, I can't think of any. All. I can't think of any. Yeah. Oh, uh, chariots. Well, no, no, they can't be reinforced. No, nope, no, nope, not chariots. No, no. not to that. No, not like <laughs> there'll be a lot of chariots. <laughs> you said host of the of the ever chosen is in a really funny spot right now. Do you think that's also added by the change to rally, and now you can only rally up yes. to ten wounds? Yes. Yes. I mean, again, like I was never on the rally bus. My attitude was. Always, I have, I, I, I was either playing Ravagers and then you're rallying in a different way. It's Rally the Tribes. Or I was playing, um, you know, more of a cavalry list at the time. And so with the change to Rally in the current system, I think like if you have a huge block of Warriors and now you can only rally, I think, 10 wounds or whatever it is, it's still good. Um, but again, here's the thing if you're rallying, it means you're not in combat. If you're a Slaves to Darkness player, those units need to be in combat, whether they're defending or attacking. You want to be engaged. Um, there's more of an argument to be made for the five-up rally in the in the Kotet because you're the likelihood of you having destroyed something completely and then in the other in the next turn rallying outside of combat is a lot higher in my opinion. But with a host, the ever chosen, your knights and your warriors, it's gonna be hard to get them in a position where you can rally them. Um, yeah, I just I don't know. I just I don't think that they. I just think Cobbles is better. I guess is what I would say. I don't think it's bad. I think that there's there's a way to play it, but it's just Cobbles with the same unit, same War Scrolls, I would pick Cobbles. Especially funny, so in the Wizard meta. I, I was going to say that you could take literally the same list that you wrote in Host of the Ever Chosen, take it over Cabalist, uh, without any change, and you would just see the difference in the list. And uh, whether you were building between the, the five up rally and the extra, oh, look, I love the extra banner, by the way. But you yeah, know, that you is always, useful. Oh, yeah yeah like having two banners is in, and not having to use a enhancement to get a third one or get that extra one is is obviously great but cabalist you're right it's a really strong one when you look at the fact that you could take a spell from the spell law take something from the the realm of um of the general's handbook and obviously the 3d6 cast heroic action uh which which is very helpful as well yeah cool Anything else you'd mention on this? I think it's a really good summary of just how no, that's good. The yeah. Regions. And then from here, it really branches out to unit selection and, yeah. and what, what, 
what you can do with it all. And we'll talk this yeah. obviously as, as we go along. Sure. Cool. Um, speaking of say, let's say your command trait, do you have any favorite ones? We don't have to go through all of them, but. Uh, yeah, I only have one favorite. <laughs> I only have one. <laughs> What is it? Uh, other than well, so there's this. I only ever really use two command traits in slaves. Uh, one is master magic, which most people I think are familiar with the reroll to to spell or cast or unbind. Um, stick it on a wizard; it's great. Or if I'm running, uh, and I've actually considered using idolater lord not just in, in ravagers, but idolater lord is a really great command trait, um, and it doesn't have to be just when you're running cultists either. So. I use it in Ravagers. I stick it on my Demon Prince. Now he's a very, very sanct sanctified, priestly uh, Demon Prince. Um, and I, he's a Nurgle, and he's going to make all my cultist units Nurgle. That's the only way you can get your cultist units to not be undivided. And you do, if you're in Ravagers, you want them to be something that's not undivided, because then they're more useful. So when he does that, everybody comes Nurgle, and then my entire, almost my entire army is minus one to wound in combat. Which again, with a unit that's somewhat has very light armor saves, having that survivability is really useful. Um, and then he's also a priest. And historically, I would say, oh, that's cool, that's fun. He can dispel an endless spell. Except now that corn is a really big problem. So corn has these nasty invocations that your wizard can't do shit about. So uh, if you need to get rid of, uh, you know, hex whatever the hex, hex, yeah, classic hex gorgeous. Uh, you have to actually have a priest. Um, and I've seen people running a dollar lord just for that, just for the access to a priest on one of your characters. And you usually, in, the, in that case, you'd probably put like a uh, curse, just get a little bit of spice on top of things every now and then. Um, a little six, little, little six to hit spice. Uh, but the main thing you're taking him for is, and is not only that, you can also dispel an endless spell. So if your opponent's getting a shit ton of endless spells off, this is one way to go, and one one fewer things, um, but mostly just the invocations. And I think it's it's uh, who who else has invocations? Yeah, I mean the main one. The main one is is well, fi well fire slayers. Fire slayers whole grain strategy is often tied to it. Yes, that is true. And I have a friend who plays fire slayers in Southern California, uh, and I, I wonder. Yeah, I wonder. If I should take a dollar award with him more. That's a good. Point. He would get very <laughs> upset. Is it who I think it is? Is it Noah? Noah. Yeah, 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 no, it's my yeah. club. Yeah. yeah, yeah, like that is one of the most easiest grand strategies because most people can't interact with it. So, yeah, uh, the fact. Can like, you imagine if, if Blades it, of Corn had that? <laughs> Blades of Corn had that as their grand strat. If it was just <laughs> make it a priest, you were like, eh, yeah. it's okay. But yeah. the fact that it allows you to then change your um your undivided keyword to be yeah. one of the others then I think that's where Idolator Lord um, really becomes powerful. Uh, I do want to question you, though, just one question around yeah. Master of Magic. Uh, given that you can't use Primal Dice and re-rolling, does that concern you at all in the current season, having Master of Magic? No, because the thing about Master of Magic is you can't use Primal Dice and re-roll, but you can still re-roll your 3d6 cast. So if you're running the slaves, you, I mean, you don't need to run a primal dice on ever. If you you could just save them for you know dispelling stuff or unbinding stuff. Um, I run it because if my I have a care, I'll usually run a general with master magic, and then I'll give them an artifact that gives them once per game and gets one extra cast. Because he's gonna have three casts at three six. There's not a non-zero chance that he's gonna roll double ones, and I don't want that to be the end of his casting that phase. Um, a lot of that list is getting all the buffs off at once in the same phase. And so I like the reliability of knowing that I'm not going to be stopped by one double double one. I can just re-roll it and it'll be okay. You just reminded me. So I've just run my own grand tournament a couple of, probably a month ago to this day. Oh, and this poor, this cool. poor gentleman, this poor guy, uh, shout out to you, you if you're listening to this. Nagash, game one, first spell cast, double one. Game two, uh -oh. first spell cast, double one. I'm like, I'm so sorry, Nagash. Oh, no. Yeah, because then he's stuck. He stopped for the salt. Yeah, that's... 900 point model not being able to cast. So obviously that is uh, a bit crazy. But yeah. yeah, it's interesting. Like, would you go sh Shaman of the Shield Land at all? Given that you've got extra spell casting, is it worth getting into Hall Frost Blizzard and obviously being able to tap into your um, traditional spell lore? 
No, nah, I think Master Magic is better. I mean, I don't think I think that there's a there's a there's probably some use case for it if you only have one wizard, like that is a Locus, and you really need to have both spells on him, both Warfrost and Blizzard. But personally, I've never had that interaction come up, so I don't see it ever being of use to me. Um, but certainly, I think that if if you were trying to do that, if you need to have all the casts on the, all the, the spells on the one wizard. Or, yeah, I think that's yeah, no, that's about it. That's the that's the only reason I can think of, honestly. Oh, no, that's fair. Is I, if your I'm list not... if your list just didn't allow for two loci to have two the two spells. Yeah, no, it's it, it's it's worth calling out. Like it's no, doesn't definitely. work. It doesn't work. Like it, there's there's a lot of great choices, and I think you've kind of demonstrated a few that's already up your your sleeve. Do you do you see? this playing through so the the null stone adornments are you someone in the current season that's purely avoiding wizards so that you can get the pouch of null dust or a, po a polished stone pebble null stone pebble i think this this is uh, i like to think of this page the null stone adornment page as the corn's extra items page i don't see why you would uh, you need to have wizards to dispel and there's really only one faction that can dispel without wizards or unbind without wizards, and that's corn. And so this was just like, oh, corn gets extra items because everyone else needs to take a wizard to get the unbind roll, and so you just need you just need a wizard for all the all the um the the, the interactions in the actual GHB. So you, you often need a wizard to do many of those things. And so, no, I think this is. I like to think of this as this is the new supplement for the corn blades of corn book. Um, and which was cute, but they didn't need it. But yeah, I, I would never use these um, because I would always want to run at least one wizard. Yeah, like I'm trying to think of any particular list that you could run that just na naturally would have no wizard, and I'm, I'm genuinely struggling. Even having just one little chaos sorcerer lord to put yeah, the ward it's on, just too good. it feels like yeah. it feels like that. Like you're always going to have his spell is wizard. great. Yeah, his spell is. He, the Chaos Sorcerer Lord has one of the best War Scroll spells in the game, and I think he should be he's a no brainer for any slaves list, not just you know usual suspects. I think he's just good in all of them. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I agree. You've got a lot and like there's some cool models as well. Like I've got the um the Warhammer the Warhammer anniversary one with all the familiars. I'm like, I just that I want that and I want the um what's yeah, they're cool name? models. Yeah. Z Zastra. Like, there's a lot of great but anyway, like Oh you're yeah, taking, I have her. Yeah, but long story short, folks, you're taking a wizard. Like, let's not even yeah. put too much yeah. list tech science into yeah. non stone wizard. adornments. Wizard. You're not going to do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Let's go through the spells, and then we'll talk about are they better or should we go natively into our own spell law. Let's start with the most powerful, incredible spell in the game. That is rupture. <laughs> I can't even keep a straight face. Uh, are you taking uh, rupture at all? <laughs> No, <laughs> let's move on to the sides. <laughs> you're not taking yeah, rupture. I, you're, not you're not concerned. No, because thankfully, no. Thankfully, no one's taking cron spines in my meta right now. But even if they were, I don't think I'd take rupture. I think the other spells are just too good because you only get one. You only get one primal spell, a primal frost spell on each wizard, and so you really want to pick. And unless you're running three wizards, and even then, I would just run an extra four frost or merciless blizzard on those wizards. So. Yeah, Rupture I wouldn't use. But the other two, Horfrost and Merciless Blizzard, are great. And they're very different use cases. Um, and different, but they're both very versatile. I think Horfrost is just another great buff for us. I think it makes some of our units that struggle, like Knights on their four up to hit, they're now suddenly hitting on a two, and it makes Knights way better. Um, so I think Horfrost lives on Knights mostly, um, and on Warriors, because if they have Halberds, they're also four up. Um, but, and I do miss Galician veterans. Uh, that is, that should come back. I need my, 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 the half inch, half inch really should come back. Oh, but, yeah. Sorry. No, yeah. I, I don't miss bounty hunters, but I certainly do think that, I actually think that should just be a core rule, to be honest. Because I some... agree. Yeah. I agree. And, and not just because with my splintered fang, my back hurts, but also just because it should, it should be a core rule. Um, but Merciless Blizzard, I think, really was a game changer, is a game changer for us, because we have access to 3d6 cast innately. It's a hard spell to get off for most people, but we can just get it off. We don't even need to add a primal die. 
or we can get a, we can add a primal die and our opponent just is like, well, I can't do anything. So it's really useful and it just immolates a unit, ideally, unless you roll like three ones. Uh, I've done that. Um, and that allows you to clear something in the hero phase, which we don't really have. We have nothing to clear units completely in the hero phase. So if you're stuck in combat with something in the, and you're going to have to wait until the combat phase to get rid of it, unless you have Merciless Blizzard. And then that really annoying like 10 wounds left on that hard to kill unit is gone and you can charge your Varen Guard or your Chaos Chosen that were stuck into something else. So that's my spiel on those two, I guess. Yeah, no, look, Blizzard's great and it does, like when you were talking earlier about the fact you don't have a lot of offensive spells, it does, this particular spell does lo unlock magical supremacy. So it is obviously a risk. But if you find yourself late game, you've got no battle tactics yes. to score, you've got a unit yes. that's half wounded that, you know, on average 4d6 should get you, well, I mean, on average it's a roll of a 14. If you think you can do 14 wounds or 10 wounds, that that's your battle tactic if you're struggling. Um, yeah, 100%. 100%. And, it's, and talking to a lot of guests, a lot of my, my other guests have talked about the value of it being a deterrent for people not wanting to get into that 12-inch threat bubble. And especially if they're concerned about double turn, they don't want to be within 12, being pinned down by, say, a unit of Chaos Warriors that you you got the minus one to wound, they can't get through it, and then it's your turn, you blizzard them, and if you happen to win priority, you blizzard them again if they're not dead. That yeah. generally concerns people. Yeah, it's interesting. This whole conversation is actually making me think I'll put Merciless Blizzard in my Ravager's list. Historically, I've been running on the one Chaos Sorcerer that I've been running, Four Frost. But I'm actually starting to think that Merciless Blizzard should just be in every Slade's list, including my Ravager's list. It's a psychological threat. Like, it's a, it's a 12, yeah, big right? time. But it's a psychological. Yeah. Like, people, when they see Blizzard, they go, right, that's always going to happen. And, that, and, and if anyone's ever seen my dice rolling, I always roll a 1 in my native spellcasting, and I'm like, I'm out. But it's always yeah. that threat that people don't want to. And I think the good thing for you is you've got, again, warriors, knights, uh, Varengard. You've got some really durable bodies that can absorb uh, an attack and then respond yeah. with, with the blizzard. While a lot of people don't yeah. have those durable screens, then they might get into the wizard. Yeah, that's 100% true. And I think part of Slaves to Darkness is learning how to use your warriors to screen and your untamed beast and you're just learning how to screen i mean it's part of the game in general but for because we have these squishy wizards that are really important learning how to screen them is really important to playing slaves to darkness what about Horfrost? is i know you talked about Horfrost and you said there's a couple of examples like the knights who are yeah really, is there is there any other recipients that you find uh maybe some secret source around like you know if, yeah uh, turning into ren three or you know someone's got a lot of attacks yeah. that yeah, it's a Splinter Fang. I mean, the Splinter Fang have three attacks each. There's a unit of 10 is 100 points. Uh, so 30 attacks for 100 points. Uh, they hit on fours, wound on twos. The wound on twos is big uh, because the, that's just amazing. And you can add plus one to hit from all at attack. Or with Horfrost, you can make it a two up. Um, or you can give them Ren three. So really, with what's great about Splinter Fang is because of the numbers on their profile, no matter what you roll on that D3, it's good. If you roll a one, they're hitting on one. One's basically twos. If you roll a two, they're hitting on twos and wounding on twos. Or if you roll a three, well, they could hit on threes. Or you can give them rend three from rend zero. So now you have 30 attacks that are going to be rend three on a 100-point unit. So I think Core Frost is really great on them. I think it's good on uh, knights and warriors just because they have that four up to hit. And getting that lower is good. Yeah, I was just, while you were talking, I was looking at some of the other... Um other cultists and a lot of them are like two attacks fours and fours no rend for one like it, yeah like it's not like there's a, a lot of high volume where you tweak one particular thing and it changes their output yeah, dramatically it's, yeah it's the two up to wound that makes this it makes it important for for uh for uh splinter bang yeah i can't i can't see anyone else um but it's a good spell. It's got easy casting value on 3d6. You're laughing as well. Like it's Oh yeah. hundred <laughs> um, percent. But is it better than some of these spells? I think because you've got a lot of great spells, obviously the banners are here. We'll talk about that in a second. Uh, 
De yeah. Demonic Speed was always powerful. Blinding Damnation uh, was always powerful. Ruinous Vigor was popular for a while. What's your What's your spell priority, or how would you rank them in in regards to what you? Yeah. Out? So I think it's uh, let's put Ravagers aside because I only have one caster. So for that one, it's not as useful as relevant. But for um, my Cobblist list, I always want to have a source of demonic speed. Because if you're running Varengard, having them go 3d6 is just amazing. Um, and I typically, I think I was running, I don't know what my list has below. I don't know if it's 6 Varengard times 2 or 6 and 3. I don't remember what I wrote. But um, having that 3d6 charge is really useful on the unit of Varengard. Especially, like I was saying earlier, when you add Levitate to the mix, now they've just hopped over your opponent and they're in all the squishies. And then they get to fight again. And you've ended their game. I mean, that is an alpha strike of all alpha strikes, is you just hop over their screens, you kill all their characters, and you go again before they've gotten to launch their buffs or whatever. So, for example, if you're playing in the OCR Bone Reapers, having the ability to just get in their face top of one, which you should, if you can do, you should do, because none of their buffs have gone off. If you can do that, that's great. And you shut down the ability for them to do all their bullshit, uh, all their crazy like stuff that they get to do. <laughs> um, but Chaotic Conduit is a utility spell. It's You're using it to get a tactic. The tactic being Lust for Power, which is just one of your wizards, or one of your characters have to roll in Eye of the Gods. You can do that by taking an objective or by doing the spell. Um, or killing something, but usually it's objective or spell. And this that's what you use Chaotic Conduit for. It's just you're fishing to get that, spell, that tactic. Um, it's an easy tactic if you use that spell. Uh, Binding Damnation is another one I would take. It strikes last. I think it requires a little planning because it's a, it's... 12 inches, so um, you have to kind of be already near them. But I think it's a useful spell when you can use it. And it's, again, with 3d6 cast, a 7 is not insurmountable. Um, Spike Tongue Curse, never used it. I think I, I, just, I would always take another spell. I just, there's, uh, you can only have so many spells, and I, Spike Tongue Cur Curse, especially now that the, the um, Primal Frost spells are so good, I would never lose a spell slot for Spike Tongue Curse. Uh, same for Ruinous Vigor. I don't, I've never used Ruinous Vigor. I don't really see the use case where, I, again, where I would drop a Frost spell to put that spell in instead. Um, so, yeah, I'd say Binding Damnation, Chaotic Conduit, and definitely Demonic Speed all have strong places in your army. Yeah, yeah. You, you've got a lot of great spells, but ultimately, as you've called out, there's not a lot of offensive things. It makes your things do better, but not necessarily a lot of debuffs and. It's interesting because you said you want to be in combat and there's some times that you get pinned by that one unit that has one model and it's it's inspired presence and like yeah. it's stopping you from charging and stopping you and how do you get out and like arcane bolt and you know yeah blizzard blizzard other than an endless blizzard, spell having blizzard you know, now. or yeah. even having like gnashing jaws or some type of other you know yeah well, and but that's yeah. worth noting. I, I, it's not we don't have really endless spells listed as a as a category. I think in this document, but endless spells are also worth noting that we have a three d six cast, which means we get our we get to, we can bring endless spells and get them off pretty easily. Um, and I think that's worth remembering is that there are a lot of really great endless spells right now. I know that Geminids is great, Suffocating Grave Tide is great, amusingly against zombies. Um, it's very useful for that. Uh, they can send them right back to where they came from. Um, so there's that, and then um, Maelstrom was fun for a while. I, I, they nerfed that, but uh, Geminids, uh, Ravenix, Gnashing Jaws, um, Grave Tide, and then there was one other. Oh, I think there's a case to be made for one of our own spells, which is the Darkfire Demon Rift. Um, I think if you're running it with two other endless spells, it could be really fun to sort of zoom around and hunt things because it's a, it's also, a, I think it's a seven or eight to cast, so it's hard to get rid of. Um, that spell is interesting, and I think if you're running a Kabbalist list, there's a world in which you take Darkfire, Demon Rift, Geminids, and uh, uh, Gravetide, and have a lot of wizard magic stuff happening. So. Well, it's funny, because one of the Discord questions, and by the way, we do have a bunch of questions that was being asked, but someone had asked, you know, how do you get the most out of the Doom Sigil? And it's 30 points. It's That's not too bad. Mm. That can fit into a lot of lists. It's not offensive because it's basically like almost like Maelstrom, but it's, it's kind of, oh, it's actually more like the, the Flesh Eater Courts 
chalice where you're yeah. counting the number of models that are slain within 12 inches and then you know a bunch of things happen on a three plus uh one slaves the darkness unit holy within 18 gets plus one attack to its melee yeah i my issue with doom sigil is not that the spell is good or bad i think it is good i think it's great value i think it could be really useful my issue is my brain is too small to keep track of what is buffed and what is not and the level of because what's important to remember about doom sigil is it actually has two sort of timings of activations because things can die in your phase or they can die in your opponent's phase and based on when that is that depends on how long your buff will be and because of that there's a disadvantage so i think it's uh when it dies in uh, I, have to, I have to look it up but because of the way it works it's often time where it'll just go away the moment your hero phase rolls around after it had just been like it became useful so the timing of it and the when it goes off and when your units get buffed means that it's really cumbersome and not frankly very useful um, and if you get a double it's completely useless so i don't that's why i don't use it it's not because of the points it's not because the idea of it's bad it's just because tracking it and then also managing it when it goes off is really difficult yeah the player whose turn is taking must pick one slaves to darkness unit wholly within 18. so if it's my turn i just yeah. pick something that is either a hot garbage combat thing or low like a low yeah. risk attack yeah and then and then at last i think until that next person's here the beginning of their hero phase is that right uh, until the next player's hero phase Right. So if you were to have control of it, it would, and, and then you got a double, it, all those things go away. So you get to pick all these cool units to have plus one attack, but then now it's your turn and you, the, all that buffs go away. And so that's where, I, that's where I think it's not, it's the timing of it. I think that if it was just a passive buff that just buffed everything nearby based on how many models died that turn, rather than it being unit by unit, I think it could be a really interesting piece. But because it's the way it's written, it's just not feasible. I think for the 30 points, you take Grave Tide. I think that's the challenge, right? You've got yeah, so many good yeah, choices. Yeah, 100%. You take, you take Burning yeah. Head, you take Grave Tide, yeah. you go for the Triumph over that. Uh, yes, and the Triumph is important in Slaves, actually. Um, depending on which list you're running, it can be really critical to have either Bloodthirsty or the No Battle Shock Indomitable. Top three banners. Uh, this is probably on. <laughs> this is obvious. This, this is obvious, right? Like... It's it's obvious to some degree. Um, I say eroding icon because who doesn't want to reduce rend? But I would actually say it's not number one for me at this point. It used to be Nurgle. number one. Nurgle, oh. no, yeah, Nurgle. So Nurgle has dropped. So number one right now is Banner of Screaming Flesh. It's Slamash. It's the plus one attack. I think it's beautiful on Chosen. I think it can be good on Knights, especially with Warfrost. I think that's a really great banner. Um, if you're running Chosen, run it with Banner of Screaming Flesh. It's they're just better. Um, because you want them to be Slanash in the first place because then they get that extra mobility, being infantry that are hard-hitting. But if you give them the banner of Slanash Flash, now they're like corn and they get plus one attack when they charge. So I think that's the one to go with. Um, then Eroding Icon, which is really useful on warriors and knights because you're never going to kill them in combat now. I mean, that you will, but it takes a lot longer, especially if you add Mystic Shield. They're on an effective one plus. With all that defense, effective zero plus. It, they're just really hard to kill. Um... Blasted Standard, I God, I wish so much that Zinch had just been written slightly differently and it could be a fun faction because I love the idea of the teleports and using them, but it's just not it's not currently workable. Banner of Rage, I put the banner somewhere else. Don't put it on your corn, guys. Um, Blasphemous Icon, I mean, if you're playing if you are playing against corn, that is all you're doing. If you are only playing against Blades of Corn, by all means run the thing that fucks with priests, but they also have the chaos keyword, so actually I take that back. Never mind. I've never used that. Oh it's yeah. Completely useless. Oh yeah. It's so, completely so like useless. So, so really you're playing you're playing into Daughters of Cain, you're playing into Fire Slayers, you're playing into yeah, if, yeah. uh Sons of if you're Sons just of playing my friend Noe. Yeah. If you're just playing my friend Noe with Fire Slayers, run blasphemous every time. If you're not, don't. Um but the dread banner I think is interesting. I think that if you're running hosts of the Ever Chosen that is when you might use the dread banner because you put it on your chosen and now whenever they kill something they get to roll two dice and pick a thing if they get a six on one of those dice that's extra rend on your two damage model 
it, that can add up. And it's also worth noting that Chosen get a pregame role, and that Dread Banner applies to that pregame role. So you could start the game before anything has happened with a Ren 2 damage 2 unit. So I think Dread Banner has some play with Chosen. I just don't think it has as much play as Banner of Screaming Flesh with a plus one attack. Or you just cast Hall Frost on them and give them Ren 3. <laughs> yeah, you could do that. Yeah. That's, uh, yeah. yeah. So right. you solved my problem for me. <laughs> <laughs> now I don't have to think about Dread Banner. <laughs> but, but I will say I do feel validated because I was doing um, the, the Slanish banner. And at, at the time when I was building it, because obviously it was just like when the brand new box came out, because you had Mr. Whippy Corn uh, at for a, a small period of time worked in Slaves to Darkness as that great ally. Well, it was so hard because everyone's yeah. like, Rage Banner, Rage Banner. I'm like, I don't want to. I want to do Screaming Flesh. Then obviously Mr. Whippy and, and All Blades of Corn doesn't work. Uh, I ran Mr. Whippy and, and All Blades of Corn at Everwinter, which was a GT held in December 2022, just as the book came out. It was like the first tournament where you could use it. And I ran Knights of the Empty Throne with Mr. Whippy Whip. And so they had plus three, it was a long time ago, they had plus three to charge, a three to six charge, all this crazy stuff. I jumped over Gavin Grigar's screen of Witch Elves at this tournament. And I was not necess- I was not very good at Sigmar, by the way, at the time. Let's be very clear that Gavin is a much better player than me now and then. But I used levitate and 3d6 charge and the plus three to jump over his screen of witch elves and land into his the shooty bow snakes i killed 15 shooty bow snakes top of turn one and got the double but you know and he's a good player but he it was fun to see him go oh well that's interesting <laughs> i just wiped his all of bow snakes in one turn yeah i, I don't feel sorry for gav um yeah, no, cool. He's, I like it. Uh, he's, he's a legend. He's an absolute legend. Um, yeah. I think we'll get to see him soon. I enjoy my games cool. with him. Yeah, I hope so. Oh, he's so funny. Cool. I like it. Uh, kind of kind of where I'm thinking. Uh, good to hear. Like, I, I do feel sorry for Zinch. Like, when you look at the um, the marks of Zinch, they're definitely the lesser of the choices. You look at the insults of banners, it is the lesser of the choices. Look, if we ever get into a shooting meta... And, you know, let's say long strikes and bow snakes. And there's certain things that are just like cities. super. Uh, yeah, super. Cities might be a great example. <laughs> if it's like, soon. Yeah. Let, 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 let's see if Fusiliers stay at 150. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, if we'll Fusiliers we'll stay at 150. Uh, and if, if that rises really to the top of the tree, then you know what? Taking a unit of, of five Chaos Knights with, a, with the, uh, the, the blasted standard that goes in you know, has a good armor save, you know, you, you have a four-up ward against shooting that soaks up the Unleash Hell. Um, you know what? That actually might be a good use case, but in most cases, it's probably not just yet. Yeah, the the only case where I, I was trying to make a list a while back that was Zinch-driven, and it's going to be a list where I turn top of one, would get every, just ring their entire army with Chaos Warriors because with the Gaunt Summoner, he can put guys in his tower. Mm. And so he can store two giant units of Chaos Warriors inside his tower. And so you would run him up on the disc and you would drop your warriors right in front of their army and then they wouldn't get outside their deployment zone. That's something I used to do in the old second edition version of Slaves to Darkness when Zinch was much better. Um, I That was a list that I went 4-1 with back when Slaves were not doing very well um this was i think late 2020 mid 2022 late 2022 um and that uh was fun and i tried to see if i could replicate that with the current book and unfortunately you cannot um there is just no feasible way of making that happen yeah i'm trying to think of a way in a world where that banner works for me and it's it's hard to justify it it really is yeah it's, it's just that everything is just better I think that's that's the common theme with Zinch. Yeah. It's like it's good, but it's not as it's good as Slanish, Slanish Corn Nurgle. Slanish Corn Nurgle, yeah. just better. Uh, any yeah. favorite enhancements that you would pick? And yes. Are you someone that takes like two enhancements or are you taking like extra? No, uh, these days, uh, historically, I would take Warlord and I would have multiple enhancements. But right now, I'm, I'm low drop. I'm one drop. Uh, either one or two drops, depending on if I'm running Ravagers or, or um, Cobblists. Uh, Conqueror's Crown, 
really great item. Highly recommend people use it, especially against zombie spam uh, or any low wound count spam where they have lots of little guys. Uh, that's the one that's going to pre prevent one to two wound models from counting on objectives. You stick that on some hero and you run them into you know, the zombies. It's really useful because now they don't count on that objective. Um, so I run that in uh, Ravagers. Uh, Helm of the Oppressor, I think, is interesting. I think it's maybe good on a Carcadrack because you're really close to the enemy, but um, I have I would rather just run Conqueror's Crown um, just because you've just turned an enemy off of their objective. So I think that's useful. Uh, with the Wizards, um, I know people are liking Infernal Puppet, Helm of Eldr I don't know if I, I've known anybody run the Helm of Eldritch Command yet. Um, partly because I think if you are seizing control of an endless spell, you have to already not be controlling one. And if you're running a, a spellcaster list, you're already controlling endless spells, so I don't think it's that useful. Um, Chaos Familiar is, I use that mainly because I like to have super duper magic phases where I'm casting seven spells and not just six in my Kabbalist list. And that's a way to do it. It also lets you pick any spell from the, the Lore of the Dam, so you don't have to take that spell like that you're only going to use once. You can just put, use this item for that and then keep the spell you want to use multiple times as your main spell pick. Um, Infernal Puppet is funny, but I haven't used it yet for any effect. So I, there's a world in which that could work. Again, if you're running Warlord Battalions and you're getting extra enhancements, these are great. And I think that you can, that we have, a, 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 I'd say four here that are useful. Chaos Familiar, Infernal Puppet, Helm of the Oppressor, Conqueror's Crown, and Conqueror's Crown being the most useful. Um, again, Slice of Darkness Demon Prince, we can just slide that to the side uh, since they're not very viable right now. Just thinking about Infernal Puppet for a second, we are seeing the yeah. rise of Seraphon. I'm wondering if Infernal Puppet, if you're doing a 3D6 casting, you're chucking your primals into it all, if you're going all in on getting Infernal Puppet off, no, it's, it's, a, it's not an artifact. It's it's it's, it's a Billy. Sorry, I'm, I'm thinking it's a spell. Like I'm, <laughs> um, would you would you go Infernal okay. Puppet? Sorry, we, we were just talking spells. It's all good. For, some, for some reason, I'm going yeah, Infernal Puppet, get it off. Fuck no. But as an yeah. artifact, would you put it onto that critical wizard who has those critical spells? Slime being a forecaster, for example. Yeah. Uh, you know, a lot of people in yeah, this wizard. Yeah, but you're not going to kill the you're not going to kill the Slime. This is the thing. You're not going to kill the Slime with it. Because it's D three wounds, and a slon has what nine? You have to you'll have to really spike it to kill that slon with the infernal puppet. And if he's still alive, he's just going to heal him with heroic recovery or some other seraphon nonsense. So I think that's what the problem with infernal puppet is: is that the big casters who are going to have the four cast, the five cast, the mega ashes of the world, they're not. They have so many wounds and wards, like they're not going. It's not going to impact them um, to enough that you would want to take that item as opposed to something else. Yeah, yeah. Look, I'm I'm trying to think of ideas where the infernal puppet and, and yeah, I, I don't I don't I don't I don't look I don't have a strong enough case. I'm not arguing for its favor. I was trying to think of a world where it could be really useful and once per battle might not be as valuable. I, I don't I don't really value once per battle abilities as much as something like as you said, Conqueror's Crown yeah. or even Helm of, Helm of the Oppressor, which is every turn. Yeah. Yeah, I, I agree. And I think um, it's worth remembering that also with a once per battle thing, you have to really know when to use it. And that's a whole skill and like evaluation of your opponent. Um, when to pop a, a, a one use is really difficult sometimes. And it's sometimes just easier for you and you're not going to make the mistake because a lot of Sigmar is playing well and making really good moves, but it's also not making bad moves. And sometimes if you have a once per battle or a really critical thing like that and you don't know and you make the wrong move, it can be really impactful. Um, so something like Conqueror's Crown is an always on is, I think, a safer choice. Yeah, and if you're going a once per battle, you do Chaos Familiar because at least then you know yeah. the sequence that, like, okay, in, in turn one, I need this extra yeah, spell. Exactly. And it's going to be... exactly. Yeah, I, yeah, I agree. I agree. I was trying to think of a world. I can't think of it. Let's not push it uphill. Um, good. Not, not not one of my favorites uh but what is one of my favorites is one of these battalions and you'll probably never guess which one is one of my favorites maybe it's it's yours as well ben what is do, do you see any value in either of these antorian acolytes or wizard finders of antor battalions well not wizard finders 
Let's put that aside. Um, Anthorian acolytes. Okay. Hard question here for me, and it's it's tough because I could run Andorian acolytes in my Kabbalist list and just have more primal dice, and that might be the right move. But I like being a one drop, and I don't get to be a one drop if I put acolytes in my list. And I think that there's a lot of value with Slaves of Darkness of being able to control who's going first, especially when you're running a list like Kabbalist where you can alpha them, maybe, but you don't necessarily always want to, or you can set yourself up for taking second. And I would rather have the one drop and get to decide that than have those extra dice during the game. Um, a lot of people are running two or three drop lists. A lot of the big scaries are more than just one drop. So if you're getting yourself into a one drop, it's very likely, I think, that you're going to control who goes first. And I think that's a really important part of the game. It's so much so that I even with the Ravagers list, which has 15 units in it, I run that as a two drop because I rather value having control over that. Historically, when we used to have the old, like the, a GHB ago when you could put your infantry in a Galician Veterans Battalion and they could fight through, I would run like 15 drop unit, like lists. I would, I would be like, oh, you can deploy all your army. I'm just going to think about how I want to deploy against your army and that'll be really helpful. But because those battalions are gone and because you are dealing with so many units, so many armies have been gone up in drops, I think us going down can be really useful. Um, so I personally would not use these battalions. Definitely not wizard finders. Um, I, it's just so specific of a use case. So there are better ways to kill wizards. Uh, I like Blizzard. Um, <laughs> Andorian low uh, the Andorian acolytes battalion. I can see being used, but my personal play style is I prefer to control who goes first or second. Can I unpack that a little further? Because for me, sure, I I've always played armies that. I rarely use Battle Reg. Like, Battle Regiment is the thing. And it's partially because it's not my preference. I'm someone who likes to play counterplay. I'm somebody who wants to see the table and respond like it's a chess game. I'm not someone who has, like, a turn one plan and tries to execute the plan up until turn five. I'm always responding. And for that, I find value in having Warlord, Entorian Acolytes, Vanguard, you know, Command Entourage, those extra tools. And whether it's an artifact, a spell, or other abilities so for me having the extra primal magic dice on a three plus has been a huge difference throughout the game now i just want to hear from you more around the value of being a one or a two drop as a slaves player is it because you don't have the long strikes of the world to start the pace and you know you want to be able to to be out of offense range or like what, what what's the thinking behind being one or two drop for you yeah, I mean, I think for me, it's it's you, whenever you go into a game, you have to evaluate. And I always ask my opponent because I like being clear with my opponent, like, what is your threat range? Can you get across the board top of turn one? Are you Iron Jaws, basically? Or are you something else who can also get across the board on top of turn one? Because that's going to dictate to me a lot about my deployment, and it's also going to dictate whether I go first or second. So if you're into an army that likes to go second, but you get, get to say, no, I'm going second, you're going first, that can be really useful. Um, if you're going into a shooting list like, say, like a you know a castle shooting list like Seraphon, um, or what's a magic -y shooting, whatever, it's bullshit. It's it's, it's evil. It's evil. Uh, should go away. Uh, looking at you, Stark. My loss at Tacoma. You're great, but I hate Seraphon. Uh, but if you're going to something like that, you want to go second so that you don't get a double where they double magic you for two turns in a row. Um, and, and in your first turn, you're just kind of straggling across the board. But at the same time, if you are running a Kabbalist list you and you get your spells off right and you do the right marks, you can alpha someone top of turn one if it makes sense. And so what I like about having a battle regiment with that list is I get to decide if it's useful for me to alpha, because I can choose to alpha, or I can choose to you know play a little more conservatively and have them come to me and then me pincer pounce on them and just wipe them out uh, bottom of two or, or uh, top of two or if I get a double or so on. But I think, um, yeah, I would say that's why I would use a battle regiment is just so you could dictate whether they're coming to you or you're coming to them. No, and it's, for it's, us, which is a combat army, that's how I do it. 
No, it's a great call out. And I wanted to hear that from you because, you know, if you're going one or two drops, you are trying to determine the pace of the battle. And as a Kabbalist, as an example, folks, you know, you only have five spell casts, five, five turns to cast spells, right? One, two, three, or five. If I face against a heavy magic army and I get the cho choice of who goes first, who goes second, I give it to my player who's heavy magic they're most likely not going to get all their spells off and they've wasted one of their five resources to, to you know, they've paid a heavy price to get all this magic, right? Um, right. So, it's in, yeah, it's interesting thinking. I just wanted you to flesh that out because for some people, Definitely. they don't care about drops. They care about the extra spell, the extra artifact. They don't care. Yeah. Well, it's interesting you say that because I think although the, the Kabbalists, I would always do a one drop, I am sometimes toying with the idea of huge drops and ravagers again um and i uh, this conversation has got me thinking about whether andorian acolytes make sense in a weird way in that list um and whether and with warlord uh and there is a world in which that might make more sense so thank you I, i'm actually gonna have i'm gonna go do a think on that because that might make more sense for that list to be more drops so that i can counterplay because that is historically how i've played that list um i have 15 units and you can drop you know, your whole army, and I've only dropped like 100 points, 200 points on the board, and I can counter based on where you put your stuff. I, I think for me, like when I was building oh. my slaves list, my, when I was building my slaves list, uh, I did have a one drop, and it was ba basically around knights and the speed of Slanesh. Yeah. Because I, because if I face a, an army, like let's say, for example, at the time, uh, Lumineth was really powerful. I want to hit Lumineth before they get protection of Hish or protection of Teclas up. So I could build through speed, the you know, demonic speed, the, you know, you talked about the run and charge, all that stuff, and I could hit you in the face before your buffs are up. But on the flip side, if yeah. I am not worried about you because your threat range is minimal, I could give the turn away, then I could go exactly. for the double and use my speed. So I, yes. there's, there's well, arguments on both sides. It's just what do you value more? Definitely, definitely. And not to say anyone's right or wrong, it's just uh, what, what do we value and... Um... Well, yeah, I mean, it's what we were talking about earlier. A lot of getting good at Sigmar is not finding the perfect list, it's finding the perfect list for you and what you like to play and what you enjoy playing because if you don't enjoy playing it, you're not going to get good at it. Or at least Speak. unless you're playing zombies, in which case, you know... <laughs> That's, you're, like, you're a weird person, but yeah. I feel, I feel like you might have PSTD of the zombies, but they look uh, nice. Yeah, but, like, I do. It's all right. My, no, my, I, I, I've, had, I've had a good game against, I've had two great games against two big zombie players and, and they were both fun. Uh, but I just think the list itself is a whole problem. My, my latest PSTD is uh, Seraphon with uh, Gotrek. It's like I'm. I'm still having nightmares at night, being uh, mortal oh, wounded from afar, and then this little dwarf idiot uh, creating this fear bubble of, uh, yeah, that's like. Yeah, I, I wonder idiot. what um, what maps you played him on because with me, like with Go Trick, I just run away from them. I don't. Have, I don't engage. I just like you run around, small man. I'll I'll go somewhere else because um, I know I'm, I'm never I'm, gonna kill him. I'm playing Horde Git, so like I couldn't run for anything. Oh, never mind. You can't. There's no, there's no escaping. You forgot it. <laughs> <laughs> never mind. Do, do, are you choosing grain strategies from the General's Handbook, or are you no. picking something from your book? No, and it's. I, I know it's. Uh, it's not a controversial take in Coach Chat, but uh, I am a big fan of dominating presence. I know a lot of folks are fans of Fall the Path to Glory which is you're entering an Eye of the Gods 12, 11 or 12 roll, and you can force that with the, the Chaotic Conduit spell. You can force it with landing on objectives with your heroes. But I do think Dominating Presence is just really... It's, it's, if you're, you're going to win the game in the sense that you've won on tactics and you've won on your play and you've won on objectives, you're going to get Dominating Presence because you'll have four units left and they can go sit in each corner, in each uh, quarter. Um, so Dominating Presence, I think, is our best grand strat i don't think that the ones from the actual ghb itself are better than it so i know some people are using overshadow spellcasting savant theoretically i guess but for me dominating presence is just you have all the control you just need to have a unit in each quarter and it'd be alive and it'd be a slaves unit so if you're running a cobbless list like i do with eight units half of them still have to be alive which you know it's 
if you should keep at least half of them alive, I'd hope, if you're still winning the game. And if you've lost all those units, well, you've already lost the game, so it's not relevant. Um, and then if you're running Ravagers, it's a no-brainer because you have it, 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 so many units, and you can bring them back, and it's not starting army, it's any time. So that you will always get that grand strat if you're playing Ravagers, I would hope. Yeah, like when you look at like spellcasting Savant, it creates a clear target and... Um, yes. Yes. Like you lose your Antorian locus, you're dead, you're general. At the same time, Overshadow is just a more complicated version of dominating presence. So you might as well just go dominating presence. So uh, I, I tend to agree. You know, like you yeah. could do Masters of the Dark Ritual, which could be as easy one. But if you go turn five and you have a player unbind that end more spell, your whole grand strat's yeah, gone in no. turn five. Yeah, like I, I wouldn't use that one. Yeah, it's rocks or diamonds. Yeah, and then bring ruin of the realms is is that is no that that tactic does that grand strat makes no sense because you're never going to do just your own four battle tactics from your book. Any time that there is a grand strategy that says do four battle tactics from yeah. your book, <laughs> uh, it doesn't it, it doesn't live in but doesn't count. It does it's not there. It's, it's, no, it's, it's not it's, real. It's not real. It doesn't, <laughs> exa exist. It doesn't exist. It's, uh, it lives in the yeah. fairy dust. What about your, your battle tactics? Are there ones that you use more than others? Actually, before I get you to answer that one, the one that always comes up, everyone wants to know, is what's turn one battle tactic for you? Do you have something that uh, is more common? Because because that because this season yeah. is a lot harder for T1. It and... is, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think it depends on the list. So if I, it's basically, am I running Ravagers or am I running Kabbalists? So I'll start with Kabbalists. So with Kabbalists... Um, depending on where our wizards are deployed, I think Magical Dominance is a pretty easy one if you're out of the zone of their unbind. So if you're on a 24, a 22 inch gap map, it's pretty easy to do that. If you're not, you might have to do something else. Um, I think if you're not doing that, then the Slaves to Darkness Lust for Power is pretty achievable. Um, it's just get an Eye of the Gods roll. And if you have a 3d6 cast with a reroll on your wizard that's out of their unbind range, that's like auto turn one. So those two are pretty good. Um, and so I would say for Kabbalists, it would be one of those two. Uh, I mean, it is a world in which uh, if you go second, you, I mean, you can, you could do things like charge or you could do um, uh, lend the maelstrom, things like that. But for, if you're top of turn one, Kabbalists, I would take, I would do magical dominance or lust for power. Um, and, uh, and then in terms of ravagers, this is where it gets more interesting. Uh, you could do, you could, Theoretically, have put Chaotic Conduit on your wizard and do Lustre Power like anybody else. But I would say you're better off doing something like Surround and Destroy. Because if, if you're running my list, you have units already near the edges of the board. So you just have one in your back and then you move outside your zone into the other two. Um, I would do something like um, Intimidate because you have so many units that as if, if it's a not a flush, you know, it's not like the zones are touching, then it's pretty easy to achieve that. Um, and I would do, uh, yeah, frankly, it would honestly just be one of those two. That, that actually, that list has more trouble with a turn one battle tactic, um, if you can't do one of those two. Um, mm. but luckily you can almost always do those two. And part of why I think I actually like running, now that I think about why I like running a two drop with my, uh, Ravagers list is that if I go second, I have a lot more options because now I can do the charge one or I can do the, you know, um, Lead in the Maelstrom, or I can do Bait and Trap, I can do uh, Enthrall the Chaos, which is, I think, one of our... It's, it's We have really good battle tactics. I don't think they're broken. I think that they're just good. Um, you know, I think in terms of throughout the game, the ones I typically hit would be on our side, and then, you know, I think on the GHB side, it would always be Intimidate the Invaders is a great choice. Magical Dominance, if you're running... Blizzard and you're desperate, Magical Mayhem can be used. Um, bait and Trap, if you're running a lot of units, so in Ravagers, yes. Um, in other are in others, well, probably not, because you don't want to retreat. Uh, Lend of the Maelstrom is pretty achievable. Again, depending on the wizards you have, like characters you have, you might not want to charge your wizard, but if you're desperate, you can. Um, and Surround and Destroy, those are all very feasible. Um, in terms of our tactics, I think... Uh, run them down is great if you have a lot of units. Again, with Ravagers, you have a ton of units, so you just need to have three of them make a charge move. Not too difficult. Uh, if you have a lot of cavalry, again, not too difficult to get that in. 
if you're running in Sorcel Banner, March of Ruin is a great great reason to actually have an in Sorcel Banner as a tactic. Um, again, it depends on the map because you have to be wholly within enemy territory and you have to have a unit nearby. But yeah, Luster Power is a classic, uh, just the Eye of the Gods roll. Um, and for all the chaos is a great late game because it's hard to do earlier because they can probably redeploy something back onto that point or they're just going to be hard to clear them. But late game, if there's one unit they have sitting out there by an objective and you can wipe that unit, that's a tactic. Um, and then the one that I think people need to be more aware of is I think the issue they're not is they don't, they, they can see, oh, priest. Okay, well, I know what a priest is. A lot of things have the totem keyword. Ask your opponent. And look at their army and see if anything has a totem keyword, because that's just kill a totem. So if you just kill their like Eidolon aspect of the sea, I think that's a totem. If you just kill that, that's a tactic. So make sure you you act you are very transparent. You ask your opponent what is a totem in your army, not just what is a priest, because you can kill a totem and get a tactic. So I think we have a lot of great tactics. I don't think tactics are very tough for us, actually. No, you got some good tactics. Uh, some little list tech that I literally just came up with in my head. You can tell me how amazing I am or completely yeah. off the mark I am in a second. Let me drop the bomb. Um, with the iron I, 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 I iconoclast, whatever that is, that stupid priest totem one. Um, yeah. One of the one of the universal endless uh, prayers is a uh, priest targeting forty eight inch mortal wound prayer. So if you take the Eidolon, Eidolon Lord command trait, making it a priest, it will have this little priest sniping uh, 48 inch oh, you're right. prayer, yeah. which will make this a little easier to do through the course of the game. You're right. That's, I always forget. I always forget that they have access to the, uh, the, the basic, basic uh, priest lore. I the only always reason, forget about bless and the, smite. That is really interesting. I never thought yeah, of that. Thank you. And the smart. only reason I remember that is because I run King Broad, who is a named priest. So the only ones I can do outside the prayer uh, in the war scroll is oh, bless funny. and smite. The only two. So I'm I'm conscious of those, those two prayers. Does smite go off on a three or a two? I think it's a three. I think it's a three. Okay, this is real. This is actually really, really. It's a very narrow use case, but I can see this being relevant against corn. So thank you. This is actually great. And it's also, good, and it's also, for, that. it's also forty-eight inches, which is ridiculous. Yeah, as all it's, board. Yeah, I can. Yeah. I'll snipe a, a, a player on my next table. All right, cool. Battle tactics. We got it. I think we got a good, uh, a, a good feel of the choices, and we've had a laugh at the same time. Um, so. Let's go through and bring this kind of to life and, you know, as much as I'd love to sit with Ben and go through every single war scroll and ask <laughs> and ask him, no, don't like, that. <laughs> like, like, Ben, when are we going to make the Centaurian Marshal and the um, the Legionnaires, like, when are we going to make them great? Or, you know, how do we build around Aeternus, the uh, the Blade of the Gorby's. First Prince? Gorby's Chariots. One, two words for you, Gorby's Chariots. Do the math. That's all I'll say uh, to people. Legion of the First Prince, do the math. There's just so <laughs> many good choices. Like, uh, but there's also some yeah. war scrolls that I can never see the light of the day. Let's bring it together yeah. and go, right, like how, how is Ben building his list? So we've got yeah. two lists to go through. First one is Ravengers, uh, Dominating Presence, Indomitable Triumph. It's a double battle regiment that we've already kind of referred to. Chaos Sorcerer Lord, Undivided with the Hoarfrost. You've got uh, a Dark Oath War Queen, absolutely love this, uh, with the Conqueror's Crown, uh, also undivided. The Demon Prince, which is the General, Idolator Lord, Sword, Nurgle, and Heal. You've got yourself two Kitty Cats, the Mind Stealer Sphinx, Fire uh, You've got one, two, three, four, four units of Splitted Fang, one unit of Corvus Caval, one unit of Unmade, two units of Untamed Beasts, and my personal favorite is two allied chaos gargans that made me so happy when i saw this uh 190 yeah. uh, 1980 300 points of allies what surprised me was 181 wounds i'm like are you a gits player like how did you get 181 wounds well and here's the kicker of that it's all those cultists add 50 percent. so uh if that's 80 splinter fang that's 40 more wounds of splinter fang Hello, we are. Yeah, and it's also the other thing to remember about Splinter Fang is they bring back snakes each turn, and snakes are a two wound unique model in them. 
So you're actually healing four wounds a turn because you have two snake collars and a reinforced unit. So uh, they're they're great. Um, there's a lot of wounds in this list. It's really so, quite surprising how many wounds there are. So mathematically, you're probably around 220, maybe 230 kind of wounds. I'd say 240. 240 is about where I'd say it is because of the snakes. Yeah, 240 wounds to wipe me. So, so what is this doing? How does it work? What's the combinations? Why the gargants? Like, like bring, explain, yeah, explain sure. it all to me. So as we talked about earlier about Ravagers being a control list, and you have a lot of bot bottles, you have a lot of units, so you have a lot of choices. And this is actually really important. So you have a lot of choices, and it means you have a lot of ways to stop your opponent from doing things. When you have this many units, you have a lot of choices where you want to move, what objectives you want to take, what you want to charge. And this is important. So does your opponent. And so one great thing about this list is you'll notice not a single unit in this list is more than 200 points. Every single unit is 200 points or less, which means that your opponent can kill a unit. They charge one unit, and then their 800, 360, whatever point unit has only really done damage to one unit. And so you've diversified all the options. So they really have a ton of things they have to attack. And so they don't necessarily know what's the what's the one to do. I mean, I know which one it is, and you know, it's it's well, Ravagers is built on a heroic action, so no comment there. Uh, but in terms of the actual play, like an opponent has to figure out what do I kill at any given moment, and knowing that most of these units can come back and then be re and then be positioned where I want them to be positioned. So and be brought back in their turn. So because it's a heroic action, let's say you kill a unit Splinter Fang. Where you kill a unit on Tame Beast, and I just need a screen somewhere, and it's their turn. I just bring a unit back, and I have my screen. Um, so there's there's a lot of, of play there. But in terms of the actual units themselves, Chaos Sorcerer Lord, Horfrost. Again, we were talking earlier. I think I might swap it for Merciless Blizzard going forward. I think that's actually really interesting, and probably better use of it is spell. But he's there for a dispel mostly, and to to be a cast and maybe an extra cast if he goes second. Um, the, and his plus one to hit, plus one to wound is always tasty. I mean, it's great. That's just a good spell. Uh, Dark Oath War Queen, I think she's great. I mean, she's Dark Oath, so again, with the Ravagers, she can be brought back as a resurrection, just like a Splinter and Fang unit. Um, she's got the Conqueror's Crown, so she runs in, she fights some stuff that's weak, and none of them count on the objective. She's not very punchy, but she's fairly tanky. She's a four-up armor save and a five-up ward and six wounds, and it's a 90-point model that's pretty good. Um... The Demon Prince, I have him for there for one reason and one reason only. And it's, oh, I, it's not listed here. Oh, Trophy Rack. He should have Trophy Rack listed as a as an enhancement. Um, okay. So the, for the all those... The, battle, the Battleshock Immunity. Yeah, it's the Battleshock Immunity. So he's going to be there. He's going to sit with all your, your clumps of cultists and make sure they don't run away, which is important because if someone has Spirit Gale or other, like the Seraphon, what is it, Comet's Call or whatever, the one that causes mortals on a bunch of units, then now you're taking Battle Shark everywhere. You don't want that in this list. Um, the Mind Stealer's Pharynxes are really good. They're sort of similar in the function to a Cockatrice in that they nerf whatever's coming in at you. So Mind Stealer's Pharynx is going to pick an enemy unit at the start of the combat phase within nine inches of it. So you put them behind your units to like, you know, create a little bubble. And then they roll 2d6 against that unit's, the enemy unit's bravery. If they equal to or exceed, that unit strikes last for that combat phase. So yeah, those Bulgors, my friend Matt Nuge, if he brings in the Bulgors, and I roll my Mind Stealer, and I roll a 6 or a 5 or whatever their low bravery is, now my Splinter Fang go first, and he goes last. And so I wipe his unit. And so what you get is, because the Splinter Fang themselves aren't particularly tangy, the Sphinx is a protection where it says, oh, well, if you charge them, you might also just go last and lose all your unit. Like, your whole unit will just die because, again, I mean, what is Splinter Fang are three attack, three attacks each, fours and twos, sixes to hit are mortals, sequence end, but still, and there are 20 of them. So that's 60 attacks, which is a lot of dice. Um, and a lot of dice for a 200-point unit. And if you charge something into them, and then the Sphinx makes you strike last, that unit could just wipe your thing because also due to this, the, um, the mortals, your, your buffs aren't going to help you. So if you're on a what up, I don't care. It's just your Catacros buffs or all your OBR stuff, OBR triggers me, uh, if you can't tell. Uh, your OBR stuff um, isn't going to just sit there and live there forever because I have mortals. 
Um, so that's that, that's it, and it just and it's just three uh, four of the units, which is just lots of a good thing. Um, and again, you're bringing them back with the snakes, and you're bringing them back with uh, the the ravager self action ability. Corvus Cabal are great. Um, I've debated whether I want to do two Corvus and one Untamed Beast or two Untamed Beast and one Corvus. I think currently with the way that the GHB is, I think one Corvus is good. And the Corvus are just there to be like, well, you could leave that objective, but then my Corvus are going to take it. And so you have that threat until turn two or three. I've also used them as a screen, an additional screen, where I'll just drop them in front of an enemy unit and now they're just there. And that the enemy has to deal with them first. Um, the unmade are great. They prevent redeploy within 12 inches, which has been very useful. So you always want to have them near your splintered tank. Since you can't move very far, you don't want your opponents to get away from you. So you want the unmade to prevent that redeploy. It also prevents rally, but rally, again, has been less of a thing lately. We'll see if that comes back with any of the order books, but um, currently rally is not as much of a thing. Uh, Untamed Beasts, pregame move is great. They get a six inch pregame move, they run onto a point, they own that objective. And then, more importantly, you can run them up and become like a screen right outside your opponent's deployment zone so that they're, they have to engage the Untamed Beasts, who will die very easily. But it means that the they're not getting to the objective, they're not getting to your other, point, your other units. So I think they're very useful as just the ultimate screen. Um, and then the Chaos Guardians, which you mentioned, are a very fun addition. Uh, because they're monsters, which is really helpful. They're 12 wounds each. They're pretty cheap. They hit decently hard, but most importantly, they give effective rend to anything they're near. So units with the enemy units within three inches who are engaged in combat with them are minus one to their save. They are a mobile purple sun. They are a 12 wound purple sun. And when you're running Splintered Fang with 60 attacks, let's all 60 attacks now at rend one. And then you could add four frost, and then it's effectively rend whatever infinite. But the gargants are there to just really hone that volume because you have so much volume from the splinter fang. If you just get extra rend, if they go from being on a two up to a three up, you've doubled your damage from the non mortals attack. So I think they're really great. I think that the fact that they're monsters is great. You get access to monsters actions, which again we talked about monsters not being as much of a play in the slaves book. But with the chaos gargants now, you get your roar, which is great. One more thing I gotta call out for my Gargan peeps uh, is my uh, favorite yeah. rule, which is stuff them in the pants. I mean bag. Oh yes, yes. Uh, which, 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 which used to be my perfect counter to your slaves to darkness banner Nurgle banner because I walk yes. up, I roll uh, a four up, and yep. that banner is gone. And you want to pull the wizard out of the Lumineth um, Wardens. You want, oh, to pull yeah. out the, yeah. you want to pull out a particular banner or a champion or something that's yeah. doing something in that unit. On a on a one wound idiot unit, on a two up, that unit, that, that model's gone. So stuff them in the bag for me. I haven't thought to use them on a banner. That's good. Actually, people have done that to me, but I never thought to do it to them. That's great. Thank you. I'm going to use them I always, now. Or even like the special <laughs> weapon, like you go into a Stormcast yeah. unit that has like a grand stave that does mortals. Cool. Yeah. I'm going to pull you out. Like anything I yeah. can do to, to disrupt you. Um, and that's just a free pilot ability. Yeah, I typically would do that with, uh, I would use them more as a, a later activation in that case to remove coherency mm. there's a little tricky thing that you can do where let's say you're facing a big unit and they really need to maintain coherency and they've already activated which means they've already made their pile in if you kill if you remove one of their night big night units or one of their chosen or whatever and they're out of coherency it's now the battle shock phase and now they're out of coherence and they have to lose half their unit I found that more when I used to run the Mega Gargan and you have three yeah. of those chances, but when you've got one, yeah. uh, I, I don't find that situation comes up very often, but it definitely is something that, that does work. Yeah. Um, one Maybe one quick question about this list, because I, I love what you shared. There's one burning question for me, and, and maybe it's the, the sins of the past, is when I've talked about Slaves of the Darkness in the past and the Kitty Cat, the Mind Stealer, People seemed pretty down on the War Scroll change from the old book to the new book. So I forget what it used to do, but it, it used to have, I feel like, a much stronger ability. Um, was it Mortal Wound Gaze or it did something? No, it was that you would, it was, it was one of those like old, like, you know, 
pub hammer archaic rules where each you and your opponent would hide a die behind a cup and if you had the same dice number nothing happened if it was different then the unit that the mind stealer had gazed at was strikes last but that was happening in your hero phase and it had a 12 inch range so it was a different use case it, it was more of a, 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 a attacking like it was more of a you're in their face uh, thing, like, or you prepped for it in the sense that you would um, set up the conditions where you would be within 12 inches and gaze at them, and now they strike last. So it would be prepping for an attack. The reason I use them in this list, and I would not use them necessarily in my Kabbalist list, is that this list gets charged. In my Kabbalist list, I don't want to get charged. Kabbalist, I want to be charging you. And with this, the, the Ravagers, I know I'm going to get charged because I have infantry. So the mind stealers are there as a defense. They are there to sit with the splintered fang and say, "You charge me, sure, but then I might just wipe your unit. Even if you're death, I could roll a ten, and mm. then your catacros or your whatever is going to take sixty attacks to the face." So it, it's a it is a deterrent and it is a protection for a unit that's otherwise on a five up armor save with one wound each. That's it. I was just wondering, because I remember a lot of people were very down on the Mind Stealer with that War Scroll change, but here you are with two. And I think you've created, and we talked earlier about the deterrence of a Blizzard. This is another deterrent because, cool, if you come in and I beat your, your bravery, and look, against Death or against Chaos, that's going to be hard. But against a lot of units, let's say a Gargant, uh, Destruction, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of order yep. outside of, you know, like, you know what, there's a good chance you're going to make them fight last, and can you handle those splintered fang attacks when you strike last? Let's, let's yeah, see. Yeah, and it's important to remember it's equal to, not beat, it's equal to or beat. So 10 is not unachievable, which is the bravery for death. So it's not unachievable to say to, you know, Big Ash, you're striking last. Yeah, but it's definitely hard, but yeah, it's not it definitely unachievable. Is. Well, to put it, to put it, to put it in this way, I was playing my friend uh, Kyle Caleb, who's an excellent uh, OTR boner, death player in general in Southern California. And we were at a top table of an RTT, and um, we agreed that basically if he, if he charged me in with his 30 of the the new the more tech guard, the little guys, or whatever the, the little OBR infantry guys are, and we, we were just like, yeah, if you roll a 10 right now, I lose, because they wipe that unit instead of being wiped the other way. Mm. And obviously, there are other chances. I mean, much more to the game than that. And he definitely outplayed me. But we we talked about it. Like, yeah, if I'd rolled a ten there, I would have wiped that unit. And that is again not a one hundred percent guaranteed chance. But even so, now imagine if it's like Gits or Bulgors and your big tanky like Death Star is coming in, and I made it strike last. That's really powerful. Yeah, uh, yeah. I'm just calling out the bravery ten thing. Did kind of seem to put people off because there was a lot of chaos yeah. running around. But there's now a, a, probably a bit more diversity with bravery and more destruction. bravery checks. Yeah. yeah, a lot more destruction and yeah. the rise of order. Uh, and the Dawnbringers yeah. are probably bringing more order to the table. Do you, you probably might oh, yeah, find I can't wait for cities. For yeah, I want more. I want more order, please, <laughs> for my mind stealers alone. Well, you asked about the rally. I know I'm I'm building like a hundred flagellants in preparation for oh, my God. my my vindicarum flagellant city rally in combat. Uh, but that's a yeah. very specific use case. I think a lot of people will build into the knights or into the fusilier build. That seems to be the more popular of the two. Okay, now I remember this list. Okay, so, I, I don't. Okay, this list. So this is Kabbalists. Um, I this is. Similar to a list I have been using, but I actually tweaked it because I think, actually shout out to the coach chat, I finally have come around to maybe the Chaos Warshine list still Nash is good. Still TBD on that. TBD. You, 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 you're missing one critical part that I had in my list. Where is our golden boy Sigvald? Uh, nah, you want to put you want to be using it on the chosen. Sig Sigvald's beautiful, but it, 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 it's the chosen that you're trying to get three to six charge on. So the same the same logic here applies as as was earlier about the flying Baron Guard. Is this list has levitate? It has demonic speed, so three d six on your flying Baron Guard. Or with War Shrine, you can get three d six on your flying chosen, and with a run and charge, and plus additional pluses too to charge rolls because of the drummer and the slanesh mark. So this is a very alpha aggro list. This list 
If you get that free up, or if you're lucky and there's a mystical, you have two sources of 3d6 charge in a turn, and you've sent your entire buffed army into your opponent top of turn one, or if you're going second, you've really gotten to them bottom of, bottom of uh, turn one. Um, I think running Blizzard is great. I think that those two wizards with Blizzard is just a super threat, and if you kill one, there's still another guy with Blizzard running around. Um, again, I would run the Slanesh on the general because you want that command so that you're chosen because they can't give the command to themselves they do need a hero to say you get to charge after you run so you have him issue that command to them and they can then run and charge uh, um i think that the varen guard are good i think that six varen guard is just a really punchy thing i'd put corn on them in this list if i was to vary this list because this is what i'm still tweaking the other one's pretty much that's my ravagers list if i was to change this list i'd probably drop i'd probably can reconsider and reconfigure to six Varengard, three Varengard warriors and drop the war shrine and drop the chosen or six Varengard warriors chosen and just be a little bit slower and have no war shrine um, like more warriors no war shrine um but i think for me i wanted to try with this list and it's one that i'll be trying at tournaments where i'm more worried about a clock in the sense that i feel like oh it's a two hour 45 minute round i don't want to hurt my back this is a list I would run because it's it's quick, it's fun, it's aggressive. Um, I do like the alpha strike aggressive list, and I also like control lists. Um, so I, I spend both ends of the gambit. Um, I would run Suffocating Grave Tide just to deal with all the zombies out there. Um, and Geminids is great against OBR uh, because a lot of their stuff is command ability based. And if you make them stop having all their all out defenses and their all out attacks and use only all their command points, they're pretty hard hit by that. Um, I, mean, I think that's not, that's pretty much it. I, I bloodthirsty because you want the extra reroll on the charge. Um, one drop so that you have you can dictate whether you're alpha or you're not alpha. Uh, dominating presence, weirdly enough, in this list is slightly easier than if it did not have the war shrine because the war shrine fits in the battle regiment. So now you have nine units instead of eight that you need to get that onto the four quarters. Um, but yeah, this is a this is a Kabbalist list. I'm sure there are many variations of the same of a similar theme. I know a lot of people are not running three class source alerts. I am a partisan for three. Some people like to run two, but that's partly because I'm such a big fan of levitate that I can't see a world where I wouldn't take levitate, and so I need to have three wizards. It's funny because a lot of people forget about levitate. So that's one of the spells, um, folks, from the universal spell law that you can choose. So it's not Arca it's not Mystic Shield. It's not uh, you know uh, Arcane Arcane Bolt. Uh, that, that's obviously your general ones. But it's a spell choice in the universal choices. You can pick levitate, and uh, there's a couple of really good use cases. A uh, flying got trek is another example of uh, of scaring oh, people. Someone had that happen. <laughs> Yeah, uh, yeah, it's it's as scary as hell. Um, <laughs> maybe one question about this list, and um, actually, there's probably a lot of questions. And and like you know, by the way, folks, like neither of these lists are like the golden list. So you tweak it, and you know, if I was running this, I probably would be less uh, less valuable about the the battle regiment as I've already talked about, and I would chuck those three heroes in the Antorian Acolytes Battalion to get the extra primal dice, but. Tweak, modify accordingly. There's obviously argument of two units of three Varengard, unit of six. That both both do different things, but uh, ultimately they they hit like a truck, and that's what Varengard do, right? Um, I do have a bunch of questions actually from the from the Discord. If you don't mind, if we is that, is that all you want to talk Please, about with this no. list? Yeah, that's it. It's pretty, I mean, I've talked most about Pablo's do earlier, so yeah, let's talk about that. Let's get the coach chat questions. All right, all right. I'm going to ask an Anthony question first. Like, this isn't even on the list. I'm going to ask okay. a question for me. Bellacore. Bellacore is something that is very popular in other armies, and Bellacore also got a points discount recently. Uh, yeah. I, don't, I don't know why. It's incredible value, discount Bellacore to begin with. Do you see a use case of Belly in Slaves to Darkness? Yeah, totally. He's a great unit. He, I probably should use him. I just... I just don't. Um, <laughs> that's the only way I think of it. It, it kind of hits on what I was saying earlier is that he is a great unit. I can see him being great in a lot of slaves competitive. I know he's great in other competitive lists, but he can be good in slaves too. I think for me, he's not the play style I enjoy. And so I've not invested the time figuring out how I would adapt him 
through either Ravagers or Kabbalists. I don't think he's bad. I think he's quite good. I think that there are a lot of great use cases for him. I do think he is actually better in other armies than in our army. I think this is sort of can be an issue with our with our book is that sometimes we have like the old Flights of Darkness Demon Prince with Corn was better in other lists and made them crazy. But I think Zinch or Corn or um, Beast of Chaos, I know that Noah Singh, who is an excellent DOC player in the US, Team America guy, he was running Bellacor um, in Tacoma, up in Seattle at the Tacoma Open uh, with great effect. I mean, I think he went 6 0 or 5 1 or something. He, did, he had a really good good uh, play with that. Uh, but yeah, that was a local, Beast of Chaos list, yeah. Yeah, there's a local guy in, in my community who terrorizes using Bellacore with flies in Nurgle and, you know, same type of yeah. control type thing. But, you yeah. know, is it something that you would add? I think the challenge is like, you know, to really get the most out of Belly, you need to put him in Legion of the First Prince. And Legion of the First Prince, as a self-faction, just doesn't seem to work unless, yeah, it just doesn't work. Like, bring back yeah, the I old could rules. See, bring back I the could old see, rules. Yeah, definitely. I could see you putting him in next to the empty throne, actually. Because yeah. he's, a sh he's a shutdown for their big bad, and you can focus on other things. Or if they're going to come at you, you can shut them down. I, I think I can see him being Kotet, actually, um, in the one use case. You might see a bit more popularity as well with the rise of Seraphon and, you know, to be shutting down Croak for a turn, especially a double turn, um, could be instrumental to a victory. But, uh, yeah, just a bit Bellicor's points adjustment. I'm like, surely, like, we're, we're, how do we get him into a list? Yeah, uh, definitely. Let's go coach questions, and there's a few of them, so we'll do them rapid fire. Uh, Broken Chef asking, uh, is there any sleeper cultist units? Ooh, good question. Good question. I mean, definitely the ones I've had in my list are the good ones, the really good ones. Um, I think that all the models are beautiful. Um, weirdly enough, I think, uh, I think it's, I want to say, if they're cultists, I think horns of the shoot. I don't remember if they're the cultist keyword um, are interesting. They have impact hits on the charge. They're decent. There's uh, a few of them with shooting attacks. I want to say it's whatever the one has that has flame burst the pots. The, the, the signs of the flame? Yeah, I think it's the signs of the flame. I think they have potential. Um, I think they have potential. I think, uh, again, there are a few that I think the shooting ones, it's, it's the issue is that they have eight inch range. So you have to really figure out how to use them. Um, I love iron golems. I think the models are cool. I don't think they're particularly useful right now. Um, Tarantulas Brood are interesting. I think that there's a world in which they could have play. Uh, and then there's, it's, it's not cultists, but they're legionnaires, so they're sort of a war cry unit that I think have interesting mechanics. And if Legion First Prince was made viable, I could see them being useful because they have this ability to sow dissension and prevent command abilities being used. Um, and they're not, again, they're not a cultist unit, but they are from the war cry range and they're, they could be interesting. Uh, but primarily, I'd say if you if you don't have them already, get Splinter and Fang. If you do have them, hold them tight and close. They're precious. They're gold. Good, good luck. Uh, like they've been sold out for forever. <laughs> <laughs> I, I always get reminded that early on they used to come in boxes of twenty. It blows my mind. I'm like, what? You could buy so many. And by the way, Horns of Hashhood yeah. are, are cultists, so um, that's oh, good. good. And I'm glad you acknowledged Signs of the Flame because that was what I was going to say because there's yeah. 70 points. Yeah, they keep going down in points, which makes them... Again, we have very cheap point units for a lot of models. So I, I all the Warcry Cultist models are a good value. It's just which are a better value. Um, Toral, uh, Toral Black asking, how viable are the Dark Oath units in the current season? So you've already shown us the, the War Queen, yep. um, a really good use of, of her. What about the other Dark Oath Rangers? The other two are Dark Oath Chieftain, uh, who, is, who you, I used to use in the old book because he had Fight on Death thing, but I now use the War Queen. Um, and the Dark Oath Savagers. Savagers would be good. If it were not for one oversight by GW, which is that they're not on 25 millimeter bases, I believe they're on 28s or 32s. This is a huge issue. They have a one inch reach weapon, which means if they are on a 28 or 32 millimeter base, you can only fight in one rank with them, and they're a unit of 10. So you're losing, and they're decent attacks. Like they're not bad. I appreciate, and their mechanics are good. I think they're a really good unit. The issue is that they can't fight in two ranks. Unlike Splinter Fang, Splinter Fang are a unit, and again, my back knows this very well, 
that is five uh, in a unit of ten. It's five twenty-five millimeters, three thirty-twos, and two twenty-eights. Which means that if you put your five twenty-five millimeters in front, then one-inch weapons can reach over those unit those models. So you can fight with the whole unit. But if you have a twenty-eight millimeter entirely unit or a thirty-two entirely millimeter unit, and they have one-inch reach, they can't. And that's the issue you're running into with Darko Savagers. Uh, so Rothgar, if they change the base size, sure. <laughs> yeah. Rothgar asking, how do you feel about the Slanish War Shrine? I think we've kind of already acknowledged this a little bit. It's Rothgar, you're thing. selling me on it. I, I know. I talk with Rothgar in the chat sometimes. Rothgar, shout out. Uh, you're selling me on the War Shrine. I'm, I'm coming around. Maybe we'll try it and see how it does. <laughs> I say Sigvold as well because Sigvold gets no, a, a no, whole Sigvold. bunch of. <laughs> I'm, I I love the combination of Sigvold with the shrine because unlike Mister Whippy from Corn, they kept that door open for Slanesh for some reason. So there that that that's a perfect combination. Or if I'm Slanesh and I was running Sigvold, I'd be bringing in the, the War Shrine. No, that is useful. Shrine. Bringing War Shrine into Slanesh, I think, is great. I don't know if the other bringing Sigvald into Slaves is the right move, but I do think bringing the War Shrine into Slanesh is right. I think that's a great choice. I, I think I think Sigvald is a good choice in Slaves. Like he's a little independent solo, uh, little little mini Gotrek um, type sure. piece. I don't know. I'm 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 high on Sigvald. <laughs> um, <laughs> I do I do I do like it. Do you think the Kakadrak is still worth it? So neither of your list actually had the Kakadrak in it. Oh man, I love that model. Um, in fact, actually, hold one second. I think I got it. A, is, it's it is. A, I have it right a, here, so I got to have to show it. Here we it go. is a great model. Here's cool. my my slap chop Kakadrak. Uh, I, I love this model. It's a beautiful model. Um, big fan. But, unfortunately, he's just not it. And the reason he's just not it is his buff is great. It means that your knights or, or chariots get to fight first. He fights first. It's a chain of craziness. But you could just run Berengard, and they're just better at hitting punchier. And he costs points. Um, I think if he went down even more points, maybe he's feasible. I can see him being good in Cobblest because he does get a spell cast, but he's not an Endor Locust, so he doesn't get the Primal Frost. He's in a weird spot. I think his profile's great. I love the model. I'd love to I'd love to play him. I just don't know where to fit him because he's displacing a hero spot in the battle regiment or he's just points. It's I just don't know where to fit him yet. But I do like the I do like the unit. I do like the model. Yeah, I, I do as well. I think if you're building around knights, um, it probably works really well. But outside of that, currently, it's a bit hard to put him put him in in the current season. I just don't feel like I need that. Feel like I need it. A uh, couple of other quick ones. So Vlad asking knights versus warriors after the battle scroll. Uh, I think it depends on the rest of your army. Um, if you want to pin them and like keep, you, you put a roading icon on both. So you Nurgle, you're charging them in. If you want to pin them where you want to pin them, so in their zone or, or more closer to their zone, run knights. If you want to hold an objective, run warriors. I think it comes down to, like we were saying earlier, what play style feels good to you. Um, if you're someone who wants to pin them in their zone and just pick off things around, I would say knights. If you're someone who wants to really just sit on a point and never lose it, warriors. Um, but they're both good. They both, they both serve the similar purpose of being a, 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 a meat pit for people to grind into. Uh, for as asking, uh, there's a couple of things that um, that they've asked, but I think the question I'll call out in this particular example is, what allies would you go with that would help enable a different way of playing? So the reference that they put down was the fact that you know some lists are using things like Beasts of Nurgle or Ardeneth Deepkin Sharks or different things that will disrupt the traditional way of playing that brings a different element to a list. Um, so you've already used Chaos Gargans as an example to uh, you've brought in from your ally pool. Is yeah. there anything else that you might pull in? Um, you know, Bliss Barb Archers, for example, anything from Corn, anything that even Nurglings, like, you know, you've got a lot of teleport shenanigans. Would you bring yeah. in a Nurgling for more board control stuff? Or uh, I can see a world. There's a one of those Corn dudes with the minus one to hit could be really interesting, the big bloodthirsters. Um, I think you can fit them in under 400. Uh, so that, that's one option. Um, within corn, I think. 
from Slanesh, I think Bliss Barbs, yeah, are really interesting. Um, I think that they give us some shooting, which we don't really have. Uh, we don't have, not don't really, we don't have. Uh, so it could peck off some like cord clearing. I think Slick Blade or not what are the Bliss Barb Seekers, the ones that are on the the, the cavalry mount, ones, the cavalry ones, the ones that are, those on cavalry, I think are interesting because they're going to reduce a save, so they kind of soften something up for you to go in at. Again, I don't think that they're necessarily better than just putting that unit that points into slaves i do think beasts of chaos have utility so even within cobbles i've toyed with running a chaos gargant um to get that extra rend i think he's a, i think he's just a great model i think he's a great uh a great piece for your army in any any of the sub factions the cockatrice i mean look they're they're a meme for a reason they're good they're just really good they're annoying but they're meme they're meme uh, and uh, if I wasn't running the Gargans, I might run a Cockatrice or two in my um, Ravagers list. And maybe I should run one in my uh, Cobblos list. I just haven't, personally don't own a, a Cockatrice. I have plenty of people I could borrow one from, so I haven't actually run him yet. Um, but I've seen a lot of people talk about using him, and I've, I've made good justifications for using the Cockatrice instead of a Gargan, or instead of a Mind Stealer. Yeah. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I'm struggling. I'm thinking of anything else that's an independent support piece that would come to, um, oh, what's the Slanesh? Uh, is it the Infernal Raptress? Um, that that I don't know. can force, I think it's the Infernal Raptress can force, uh, if I think we're correctly, uh, it, I, I'm going to look at the war scroll to make sure what I'm saying is actually accurate. But in the meantime, I'll ask you, um, what do you think from Moon Tyranid saying, what do you think Slaves lacks the most at the moment? Ooh, good question, Moon Tyranid, because uh, that's a good question. What do we lack right now in the current situation? I mean, definitely, that's a tough question. I mean, because I think we have answers to everything. Uh, we know we're just the best. Um, I think... It's not so much what we're lacking, it's that certain armies in the meta right now are just not fun and they're kind of broken. I mean, they've resolved that a lot with the latest Battle Scroll, so I don't want to go too far back in time. But with death, it's been tough because I think even with some of our punchier stuff, chewing through that many zombies has been really hard. Um, I think we lacked, again, we lacked offensive magic. We now have that with, with Blizzard. Um, I think... With the points drops, I think we're actually in a really good place. So I'd say, I mean, we obviously don't have shooting in our list, but that's but that's part of our mechanic. So, um, yeah, I can, it's hard to say what we lack. I mean, we have offensive magic now. We have access to all the same endless spells everybody else does. We have fast stuff. Yeah, go, go, coach. What do you think we lack? Good monsters. Oh, yes, good monsters, which is why I was saying you have to lean on Beast of Chaos to get some monsters. Very good point. We don't have good monsters. Thank you for, yeah, we were talking about that earlier. No good monsters. Bad, no, no good monsters in our book right now. Not really. It's a, it is a shame. I was just thinking about our discussion. Like, can we make yeah. the, is it the spoilers? Is it the spoilers? The plus two. Yeah, two, make the spoilers like, viable. Like, like yeah. can you make it viable at all? And like, I think the answer is, is, is unfortunately, no. I think it's, it's no. hard. Uh, you, could, you can run for more Mutalist Vortex Beasts, but um, I, will, I will just commend you for doing that. I don't know if you'll win a tournament necessarily. Someone did ask me about some advice around Mutalith Vortex Beasts. I'm not, I'm not going to ask it to you because I feel like it's a, like, no, uh, oh, no two I final. They're, <laughs> I thought they're, they're hilarious. Oh, look, hilarious, there's, some, there's some cool. Like, I, I, I want to make the slaughter brute work one day. I don't think I've ever seen a slaughter brute in in eight years. Ever? Yeah, I, I, I mean, it's a, it's a well, it's not exactly the best model either. So it's not like there's even a hobby reason to run it. To be honest, <laughs> no. Rothgar asking the second last question, which is how are you addressing fast keep away shooting armies like IDK shark spam? Well, it's so funny you say that because I played uh, against, I think, very highly ranked Aaron Newbaum of yep. IDK fame at uh, Old Town Throwdown with a Kabbalist list that was built on aggro. And how did I deal with him? I think I went, I took second because I didn't want to get double shot by him. And I had, I think, yeah, I was the one dropping. There's more than one. Uh, I took second and he, I just made sure that my guys were, I mean, I had a lot of units with high armor saves. So his shots were annoying, but they weren't going to destroy me. Um, I got my wizards in a place where they couldn't be targeted now with the 12 inch outside range. They couldn't get to me. Um, 
and then I he came forward, and then I have just threat range of the Vanguard, and they just plowed through his sharks. Um, I got really good dice, I guess, on the three to six charge, but even within that, um, they just ate, ate unit after unit after unit. Um, I think he, yeah, he he conceded actually top of two because I think I, I won the double, and he was like, I, I, he's lost half two his army three, at this point. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it was, it was going from one to two. So I went, he oh. went first. I took bottom. I wiped about a third or a half of his army in the bottom of turn one with the Varengard plays. And then I won the double into two, and that was it. Yeah, I, I've been on the receiving end of um, of that type of play. So yeah. at LVO, uh, my only loss, I went 4 1 with Gargans. And my only loss was against um, Archaeon with all the Varengard. And Gargans don't have any screens, right? So going in, charging in Archaeon with Demonic Speed, um, having the double fighting um, Varengard, just like, not, not yeah. that I conceded that early, but just like it, it can be brutal um, yes. when you hit that in the turn. You hit the turn one charge, you double fight before the buffs are off, and it's just a massive uphill battle. So I can appreciate. Yeah when those things line up, how hard it is to kind of respond. Yeah, no, shout out to Aaron. He's a great sport and we had a good time. I, it's a, I'm one of my favorite people in Southern California. And, uh, hope everybody takes a look at his stuff about Hydenet and Big Log and things like that. Yeah, and I think he writes a Warhammer as well. Like, great, he does, great player, yeah, he does. Great, great, great player, yeah. number one ITC at the guy. moment for, for IDK as well. Is that, no disrespect. They're just like, a good, good, and good dresser too. People should look. This man, like, he dresses to the nines every oh, time. He is pimptacular. My yes. last question coming from yes. Torrell, and then you can kind of uh, you know, bring us home and shout outs and things like that. This is a really good question and a nice one that um, I will finish off with is if you had to pick a chaos god to serve in real life, who would it be and why? Oh, that's a loaded question. Oh, I think Slanash has the most fun, so I think that's the answer. I mean, everybody else seems kind of not as happy. Slanash seems like, seems like a fun time. I don't know. Maybe I'm just a Southern California Edenite. I don't know. <laughs> you're in Hollywood. That's the, yeah. I'm in Hollywood. That's the answer. <laughs> that's the last, you're, you're, you're already living in one <laughs> of the already, rings. Of, I'm already rings. debased, yeah. <laughs> I think for me, it's that or corn. Like when I go to the gym, I always, my, my gym routine is a corn yeah. routine. So I do uh, I do reps of eight. I make sure like it's oh, game yeah. I'm even thinking in my head, like I need a shirt, like, you know, Chuck, Chuck Moore has like a uh, storm car strong. I need like gains for corn and like have oh, like man. some. Oh man! We gotta go to the gym. We gotta go to the gym when you're here. I didn't know this. We gotta go to the gym. I oh, trust me. Trust me. Together. My, myself and Chuck <laughs> were already lined up. Uh, the world, the world champs. We're gonna do some gym sessions. Oh, good, so, good, love it. Like gains, gains for the gains, God. Yes. Ben, any shout outs anywhere that people can chat to you? Are you on X? Are you? I know you mentioned yeah, you're on I my Discord. X, like. Yeah. Yeah, I, yeah, yeah. I hate, I hate calling it. I feel like I feel dirty. I feel like yeah. I'm, I'm like enticing you to my OnlyFans. Like, like no, where, no, where can it's... people chat to you about slaves? Uh, yeah, people can chat to me on uh, X slash Twitter slash Elon Musk's whatever, um, whatever he's gonna call it next. Uh, I, what was my handle? I, I think it's just look up Benjamin Hosking. I honestly send, forgot my handle. Send, send it to me. I'll add it to the description. Yeah, right, so uh, X, yeah. X so do that. But also, if you're in coach, I'm all, I'm active in the Slaves to Darkness uh, sub channel, and you can hit me there. Uh, I don't know what my name is. I think it's just Ben H with a little snake because uh, I play snakes. Um, and people are welcome to reach out there. But I'd say yeah, Twitter or there are both great places. Um, I'm also on Instagram, but that's mostly film stuff. And people are welcome to follow me there too. It's Benjamin Hosking. That's just my Instagram. Um, and then uh, shout outs that I really want to shout out. Uh, first of all, thank you, Coach, for having me on. This is a pleasure. I've been watching your videos since I got back into Sigmar, and they're very fun and very lovely. The pleasure person, has so. been all mine. I'm interrupting you briefly. The pleasure has absolutely been all mine, and I can't mm -hmm. wait that people start watching this because as soon as I told people I was talking slaves and I mentioned your name, like everyone cheered. It was like a big, yay. Like, oh, sorry, cool. that's a, that's, so that was a bad Monty <laughs> Python. I'll be watching Holy Grail. <laughs> it's like, yay. That's okay. It's okay. I, I, it, that's fine. Holy Grail is a great movie. Um, I'll take the yay. Uh, but the um, people I want to shout out, um, I want to shout out uh, Scal United, which is my club uh, in Southern California. A um, bunch of great, bunch of great uh, gentlemen in there. Uh, and I want to shout out my team captain, Matt Nguyen, Nguyen. I 
I'm trying to figure it out, but it's news to everybody. Uh, uh, the news, um, the news, the news. Yes, yes. You don't even know who I'm talking about. That, that's the news. That new one. Like I was just talking yeah. to him. Like, you, yeah. You know, you, you know, I'm SoCal, right? Like, I, I, I was top five uh, last year from one event. Like, oh, oh yeah, oh yeah. You're, you're, you joined us. You're in us. Uh, but yeah, no. Uh, Matt, Matt is a, a team captain and, and a great guy, and, and also Noe, who's been a great co-captain with him. Um, and then, uh, and, and just all, all great people and, and, and stuff. And then also I want to shout out uh, Gareth Thomas, who is our, who is, you know, the world, the universal TO, let's be real. Uh, and, and we'll be TOing uh, every tournament. I, I, it's hard to say one that's not TOed by him that's any good. So, you know, I mean, there's lots of great ones. Don't get me wrong. Lots of great TOs out there. Just Gareth is, you know, he's setting the bar. Um, and uh, I want to shout out him and all the work he does for our California community, but also for the Sigmar community in general. And I want to shout out Old Town Throwdown, his organization, which raises funds for autism advocacy and like great events. And so um, I think it's just a really great community we got down here in Southern California. And I encourage people to come and play in our events. We go to a lot of Midwest and East Coast events, and we'd love to see you Midwesterners and East Coasters or Australians or Kiwis or whatever. Come to our Southern California events. We'll treat you good. I was partially at Old Town Throwdown. I donated the, um, the a Slanesh model for to, to, to raise money. I for remember. Charity, so, yes. So I was, I was partially. I was there. You, you were part there. You were part there. Yeah. No. Uh, it was a great time, and um, I think I don't know if Teams is full yet or if it's done signups, but there is an Old Town Throwdown Teams event going on November third and fourth, and it might not be too late to sign up. So if you can get a team together, you should you should come down. Or be a barbarian because there will always be late drops. And by the way, the Infernal Raptress was the unit I was want to talk about because okay. the Infernal Raptress can choose when a six when an enemy wizard successfully casts a spell within twenty four. You can force the reroll. So if they force the reroll, they can't use a primal then to extend it. So if hoar frost yeah. happens or blizzard happens, you stop it, and they can't do a primal to get it any higher. And then like, haha, jokes oh, on you. Yeah, it's not a bad little okay. unit. It's 120, 120 points. 120? Okay. Feasible. Fittable. Not bad. Not bad. Ben, you've been an absolute legend. Thank you so much for the discussion. I hope you, everyone who's listened to this has taken away incredible insights, a lot of ways to think about um, Slaves of Darkness, both as a faction, but also in the current General's Handbook 2023 and how we're kind of making the most of the rules. If you've gotten this far, if you're new to the channel, please press like. I would appreciate it if you press like, subscribe, leave a comment. Tell me what your thoughts are and what's been working for you in the slaves world. But, uh, and as you mentioned, the, the Discord is, is great and lots of awesome slaves players like Ben sharing insights, knowledge around and, you know, discussing lists and what works and what doesn't work and some ideas to help all high tide uh, lifting all the boats. But that's all from me. Ben, you can go to bed. You've been an absolute incredible guest. I can't wait to see you in a month's time. And then two months after that, I'm pretty sure Ameri <laughs> I'm pretty sure American uh, they might think that I'm a drug runner if I'm coming to America twice in three months. But if you're at LVO, mm -hmm. if you're at the World Championship, you'll come see see both of us. Yeah. I'm gonna hold you to looking and seeing if you can get me Pasciona or Pasito from Australia, because that stuff is so good. Uh, as long as it doesn't explode and the Atlantic guys... Oh, we'll see, yeah. Yeah, we'll if, see. If the Atlantic guys have said, like, if it explodes in my bag, they'll, they'll help you wash it. <laughs> All right, well, thank you so much. No, no ple pleasure's been mine. I hope everyone's enjoyed it. Thank you, and uh, we'll chat again soon. Thanks for hanging around until the end. I hope you enjoyed that video and you walked away with a few new ideas. Now, if you did, I would love it if you pressed like on the video, as well as left me a comment with your thoughts. The conversation will continue over on Discord, and the link is down below in the episode description. I also want to give a massive shout out to the AOS Coach patrons and YouTube members who are supporting the channel and the growth that you're seeing here. So cheers, you are all bloody legends. And until next time, don't roll a double one on a spellcast.